Uh, we want to thank a couple of our fellow library departments too. So our media library, and I hope some of you got over the gaming session there yesterday. They've been a great model for us in collecting materials in this area and great collaborators. Our external relations department in the library, uh, we have one representative here from there. Um, they have been just wonderful with event planning and branding. That's how we get press start logos and so on. Uh, we have several great sponsors, including Starship Bagels, who provided our breakfast this morning, and some others who just make sure that we have some uh, a nicer experience here today than just the bare bones. And I always have to check my list for things. Um, the College of Music, of course, is letting us use their facilities. We're really grateful for that. Um, and then we have lots and lots of volunteers who are, some of them are student assistants in the library, some are college of music students, staff, so lots of people who are helping out today. Um, and I especially want to thank our core planning team made up of Mike Brubaker, Sabino Fernandez, and Kristen Wolski. This was their idea, their plan, and they worked so hard. I think we're all going to enjoy the fruits of their labors today. So with that, we want to hand it over to our presenters and thank you so much for being here. And I think Lady will help introduce our next folks. So thank you and welcome. Thank you so much, Susanna. And we're going to take a very, very quick break to get set up for our first panel of the day. So please stay tuned. We'll be back shortly. So oh, yeah, this panel will be an academic and industry support for video game music. And I will start today by letting the panelists introduce themselves. So yeah, I'll be introduced, uh, people will introduce themselves. And yeah, let's get started uh, with Angela. Hello, um, I'm so excited to be joining you all. Um, I'm Angela Vandenelsen. I'm um, the reference and learning technologies librarian here at Lawrence University. I'm also an assistant professor and I teach um, courses. I teach intro to game studies, history of video games and gender and intersectional identities in video games, um, as well as run the campus maker space. And right now I'm working on an article with a member of our conservatory of music about um, music and memory in the Kingdom Hearts series. So I'm really excited to be learning more about um, this area of scholarship and ludomusicology, as well as sharing what I know with all of you. All right, thank you, Angela and Jacob. Hi, uh, my name is Jacob Collins. I am a PhD student here at the University of North Texas. Um, I wrote my master's thesis on a video game topic and I'm currently working on an article for a, a book uh, that's edited by Dr. Gibbons um, uh, on jazz and the detective adventure video game. So I'm really excited to be here and look forward to the conversation. All right, and next we have Mark. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, I'm Mark Sweeney, Executive Director for the Society of, Society of Study of Standard Music and Games. I did a PhD on aesthetic theory and video game music at Oxford almost 10 years ago. Uh, and since then, co-founded the Luda Musicology Research Group and helped to found Triple SMG in about 2016. I'm currently working for a commercial publisher um, supporting societies, institutions, funders, authors, and other publishers. Um, and I'm really grateful to be invited to join the panel today. Thank you, Mark and Will. Hi, everyone. Really excited to be here. I'm Will Gibbons. I'm Dean of the Crane School of Music at SUNY Potsdam in upstate New York. Formerly, I was Associate Dean of the College of Fine Arts at TCU, just down the road from UNT. Uh, and I'm a music historian who mostly works on music and video games. Okay. And I guess I'll, I'll go last. So I'm the moderator, Joshua Deringer. I Currently work at the University of Minnesota Libraries as a cataloger. Next week I'll be a, I'll start my new position as a music cataloger. Looking forward to that. So my main interest, as pointed out by Susanna Cleveland earlier, is how libraries can support video game music studies and video game music in general. So with, on with that. So I guess the first question I'll pose to the um, panel today is. Yeah, what ways can universities support students wanting to go into ludomusicology or game development fields? Um, I'll, I'll start if that's okay with um, you know, going off the, um, Joshua, your um, goals as a, a music cataloger, you know, um, and my perspective as a, a librarian. Um, 
I think a, a big thing that we can do is to provide the collections that students can use to do the research, to, um, to play the music, the musical scores and soundtracks, um, as well as the, the tools and space to create their own music. Um, I'm a, a big fan of libraries providing not only traditional research materials, but also um, equipment as, you know, uh, like a, a, a library tool, um, research um, tool, I guess. <laughs> um, and as you know, so the software, the equipment, the um, keyboards, um, MIDI keyboards, things like that, as well as the, the space that's available to, to all students um, who want to pursue this, no matter what, you know, areas they may currently be studying or classes they may be enrolled in. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I think for me, a lot of it is about um, exactly what Angela just said about creating spaces, um, whether that's physical spaces, whether it's space in the library or rehearsal spaces or um, whatever, or, but also, um, thinking about it as a as curriculum as a space, right? Creating space in the curriculum for um, students to participate in whatever it is that, that maybe is, is interesting them. So, um, you know, maybe that's loosening performance requirements to allow the performance of video game music as a, as a valid art form, or maybe that's, um, you know, allowing courses in video game music or um, e either, you know, theory or history or creation or whatever the case may be, um, just, again, sort of creating that opportunity, those spaces. My own personal experience, just reacting to hearing Angela and Will, um, is just how, how much progress has been made over the last decade or so um, in, in our approach and how much support there is. I, I feel like when I and many others first sort of embarked in working in this sort of research space, um, it was, there was flexibility in, in many courses around film music and, and sort of popular music and other areas, but there was very little understanding or recognition um, for working on video games. And, and my own experience was just to fund and self-fund and, and work on the games that I, that I bought and played myself and was interested in. So. It's, it's really exciting how much, we, how far we've come in recent years. I guess uh, as a student, uh, one of the things I'm concerned about is like access to material. Um, because you can only get so much done through Let's Plays on YouTube, um, but you can get a lot done, but there's only so much you can get done when you're especially trying to study like interactions with players and the music. Um, so that's probably one of my primary concerns and from an institutional level. <clears throat> yeah, and yeah, speaking from uh, libraries, that it's just um, providing yeah, the resources needed and also like we love requests when, yes. when we want to. <laughs> So like any like requests that you all have or any services you would like to see, we will try and do it as feasibly as we can. Yeah, and I also wanted to bring up like um, for libraries that are more curriculum based, like they can only collect based on curriculum. I think that um, ILL, you know, library loan and consortia will be important in the coming years. So um, University of Minnesota has, been teaming up with the Big Ten Plus libraries to just assess collections and, and what various universities can support or like collect on. So I'm hoping that this will turn into a good partnership with all libraries in the future. So in regards to, um, yeah, ways um, for student support, I was also wanting to see like, how can universities like financially support, like I, I actually was in a conversation earlier about this this morning, so it's it's relevant. It's like, it would be great if students had funding to go out to these kind of conferences and uh, have their research published and everything. So, I mean, what are universities doing now, and what um, is in the future for this?
I'll jump in. Um, I, uh, I think the conference circuit in this space um, is really dynamic and exciting now. And there's a lot of events like this one uh, and, and regular annual conferences. Um, and I think it's really critical to participate in those um, forums, uh, even whether you're presenting or whether you're just attending. And obviously since the COVID pandemic, it's really accelerated the transition to um, online formats or hybrid formats. And that's great, but I do believe that certainly for researchers interested in, in moving to a post-grad um, study, um, that live networking and that live participation with colleagues is really important. So certainly from a triple SMG perspective, it's a, a key goal of ours to try and um, help develop travel grants to support attendance, because obviously this is a very young field. Um, dominated disproportionately by early career researchers who, who need financial support and don't often have uh, conference support from faculty or other, other, other um, options. So um, our funding is currently very limited, but certainly it's a high priority for us. In um, going off of Mark's comment about the conferences moving virtually, um, the, you made a really good point about how conferences, when you're there in person, you do get much more um, interaction with fellow colleagues and researchers. Um, from, but from, I think from the undergraduate level, I think it is, I'm, and you, you also mentioned how beneficial virtual conferences can be as well. Um, and I just, think that you know the students here at Lawrence University which I forgot to say is where I work um, <laughs> um, you know we're all they're all undergraduates and um, just being able to realize that this area of study is out there by attending virtual conferences I think is a really excellent opportunity um, because you know as many virtual conferences or, or attendance of them um, is, is free oftentimes, um, you know, it allows the students to kind of get their feet it, into the, the pool of um, uh, Ludo musical, Musicology. Oh my gosh, I tried saying this in one of my classes, I'm just gonna music, video game music research. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, it's a, it provides a really excellent opportunity to get started that doesn't require funding um, because, you know, adding any new area of study in a university usually requires either somebody donating a big chunk of money or moving money around, especially when it comes to like library collections. Um, so, you know, that can, that's an, kind of, I guess, another point about um, the the money that's required to, to get started in this area of research and for students to be able to do that, you know, how we can, you know, and then these virtual conferences can maybe give the students the chance to know that they really do want to study this and that the university really needs to invest in it and move that money around or find that big magical donor everyone wishes for. <laughs> Yeah, I think sometimes as an administrator, I, I think a lot about, um, is it Lamont Young's definition of minimalism, you know, ma maximum effect from minimal means. Uh, and I, I think about that a lot in terms of finances, in terms of, you know, I'm always looking for how can we have the maximum effect from the minimum amount of money um, that we're, we're working with. And so, you know, if, if I have, let's say, um, a uh, graduate student who has a, a really wonderful opportunity to present at the Ludo conference in the UK, like that, that's going to end up being a really massive um, uh, amount of money. And you think, wow, okay, we could spend $2,500 to do this, or we could, you know, direct that to the library and we could purchase a whole lot of scores and books, um, which may have this sort of long-term effect. So I love the idea of, of looking for these opportunities, like undergraduate students attending, I hope maybe there's a SUNY Potsdam student or two uh, watching today from our video game music class. Um, uh, uh, this kind of conference is a fantastic opportunity for that, where there's a virtual option uh, and there are other options as well. And then, you know, as we're getting into different phases, maybe that is the, the high impact thing that we want to divert resources to, um, you know, and, and 
not to get overly philosophical about it, but I do think resources are almost always a zero sum game. Um, so we have to be willing to, to divert resources to uh, ludo musicological research or curriculum or whatever the case may be. We have to think about what we're willing to pull, pull back away from. Um, and that, that is a, a, a real challenge. Um, and so I think a lot of schools are probably going through priority conversations about that. And, and you know, I am biased, but I certainly think this is an important field to support. Um, so, you know, that, that's going to come at some cost to something. So, yeah, I, I guess we have to decide individually and collectively what those things are. To kind of echo some of the uh, things that were said earlier about access or uh, about awareness, uh, like I'm in a, a member of Gamut, which is an association of musicologists and theorists here. And so I kind of am the spokesperson for this kind of thing. I, you know, say about conferences and stuff like that. Uh, I, I would like to, you know, just be aware that more of these things are happening. And I have, since I'm kind of in this area, I know about it, but uh, some students, some of my, my peers may not know that this is as, when, you know, fleshed out, this field is as fleshed out as it is. And so I think that, you know, just being aware that these things are happening, it could have a big impact too for no money. Yeah, coming, um, I mean, hinting at the later panel on Ludo, it's like, I wish I had opportunities to learn about these things when I was an undergrad. Because yeah, this I I really just delved into this last two years. It's been really a, an, an interesting field to go and see all the papers and conferences. So um yeah uh, so uh, in um, connection with this, are there any like scholarships or grants out there right now that you all know of for like studies of game well game music and I guess in general that could be applied to game music. <laughs> I'm I'll just say I don't know of any scholarships or grants specifically targeted at video game music performance creation or um, scholarship. Um, I would love to see that, but I can't name any. I, I think there certainly are lots of opportunities out there that where we could apply, um, but you know, and people have certainly gotten grants and um, uh, research fellowships. I think based on this kind of research and work, but I can't think of anything specifically. I agree. Um, we've certainly partnered with industry partners and sponsors to support conference expenses to keep conference ticket prices as low as possible for attendees. Uh, but I haven't seen that translated into specific sort of whole scholarships for doing the research directly. And there are some interesting opportunities with organizations like Think Space Education, you know, who do a lot of work in, in this area. Um, so as, as Will said, there's, there's, there's plenty of opportunity to do more. And there are organizations who have funds who are interested. Um, we just need to make the right connections, I think. I think um, kind of echoing, um, it is kind of, important for um, people who are looking for scholarships and funding for these kinds of things to maybe look at the more general things and then be more creative about how to apply that to the, um, you know, maybe music research or media research and then applying that to um, the video game music research specifically. Um, that's kind of what I see now. Um, and, and Lawrence here are, um, all our seniors have to do a capstone project and there is funding available for students to be able to pursue something extraordinary or something that just needs some kind of additional funding. Um, so, you know, it, students may have to, you know, from the student perspective, they may have to look to, to things like that that can help them do their, um, explore their um, own paths in music, video game music research. Yeah, I think that's right, Angela. That's that how I funded my master's through an a, a general AHRC grant. It wasn't specific for video games, um, although that's what I focused on in my dissertation at that time. But there are there are plenty of um, well, not plenty. There are some um, generalist grants. 
you know that's that's good to think about i yeah, i didn't think about like going to, to the generalist scholarships i know like for some like conferences like music library association we have some travel grants available for that so like yeah just thinking out like thinking outside the box i guess but yeah hopefully like i don't know sometime in the future like there will be some more uh, like money available to specifically like the research and attendance to video game music conferences and research, yeah. I will say quick quick addendum to that. I just remembered that the, the Strong Museum in uh, Rochester, the Museum of Play, does have some research fellowship funds. I know a few um, people have gone to do research there based on, based on that. So there probably are some, have you, yeah, you've done one, right? Yeah, okay, perfect. Um, but so that, you know, maybe institutionally, that is one thing um, where we could sort of circling back around to the first question, um, maybe the libraries that do are sort of accumulating these archives that could be sort of a priority, um, creating those kinds of um, research fellowships or, or, you know, housing allowances or whatever the case may be. There are a lot, you know, if I want to go study medieval manuscripts or whatever, um, you know, maybe the Newberry Library in Chicago, I know, you know, or the uh, New York Public Library, places like that, they have um, fellowships uh, that you can apply for, and they're sort of prestigious. It would be wonderful to see something kind of on a similar level at some library to study in, in uh, game archives. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Um, I'm thinking the, the Frisco Video Game Museum, whatever it's called, I would, I would be very interested, especially because it's so close to here. Um, it won't help everyone, but it's close to here. I'd be interested to, uh, I've been there before. They have so much stuff. I'd be very interested to see if they would be willing to kind of partner with this kind of research thing. So I don't know, that, that's a great idea. I like that. Oh yeah, I've been there too. It's very nice. Um, I think I saw they advertise some, research grants some like sometime in the past so maybe they'll do that again but yeah I was I just remember that just now so yeah I mean there, there definitely is thankfully there definitely is funding available for people to use so I'm gonna go like completely off like off this topic so something that came up in our pre-discussion was uh like copyright intellectual property and access of video game music so this is very general, but what is your experience with uh, copyright and intellectual property of video game music? And how does it affect, um, well, academia and the industry in general? I can start on that one, I guess. And, and just say, in, in my experience, um, academia is terrified of these things. Uh, we, we are really, I think, in some cases, overly cautious about um, about what's going on there. So um, as, as Jacob mentioned, I'm, I'm co-editing this uh, Oxford handbook uh, of video game music and sound right now. And um, I think maybe half of the chapters have had some question come up about, well, can I do this? Can I put this in there? Can I do that? Can I do this? And, and very frequently the answer is, I, I don't know. Um, and no one knows uh, half of the time, you know, you reach out to a composer and you say, hey, can we use a snippet of this music? And they say, I don't, I don't know if I have the rights to that. And you reach out to the company and they say, oh, well, I guess the composer has rights to that. And, and you get in, you know, so you just end up saying, well, it's going to be easier if we just cut it. Uh, and so we end up doing a lot of that. Um, screenshots are another one where there's sort of a gray area of, I think we're always good to put in screenshots, but it's probably better not to ask. Um, you know, anecdotally, I know um, a game study scholar, I had a cover design for a book and sent it to, um, uh, I think Square Enix or somebody to uh, um, approve, you know, and they basically started asking way too many questions and then he way backed off on it. Uh, and, and so I, I think it is a, a, a real area where we could stand to have um, some advocacy and some education going on um, about what, what we can and can't do. I'm sure Mark could speak to that a lot from the publishing perspective as well. Yeah, I mean, this comes up all the time in, in our the Ludo's uh, book series with intellect. And interestingly, the sort of publishers don't always provide as much help and advice on this sort of thing as you'd want them to. They often leave it on the, the editor or the author, um, and it's their responsibility to clear permissions, and, and they don't get a lot of guidance. 
I think a lot of publishers also aren't used to working in this space with video game companies where the the rights, like you say, it's it's not always super clear. There's these very large publishers who um, who have you don't necessarily have very clear attitudes to to um, use of their their materials in uh, academic literature and, and sort of uh, criticism. Um, certain companies notoriously uh, difficult. Um, and, and, and I think you're right, Well, there's very much better ambiguity around how worried should authors really be, because a lot of the time people just roll the dice and everything's fine um, because you know, the companies don't really care. It's not really a commercial impact on, on them. Um, and other times, you know, we certainly you see on YouTube, this, this issue comes up all the time uh, with um, takedown notices on, on videos. Um, happens, happens a lot. Um, we definitely need to provide some kind of playbook or guidance to support um, authors in, in navigating these issues, but it's really complicated. Um, and it's... These are often international publications where the rules differ in different countries, definitions of fair use differ, um, and it's, it's really hard to get to get expertise on it. And um, kind of going off that idea of the, the game publishers not really knowing whether you know they might have the rights to a certain piece of music or certain aspects of their game. Um, kind of goes along with that historical trend of um, game publishers not necessarily thinking about archiving their games and, um, you know, then others taking it into their own hands to make these games available that aren't available on, the, you know, on the store shelves or to download from the publisher or Steam or something. And um, this is something I um, talk about with my students a lot and they think well it's not available so of course it's okay if I play an emulator um, of course everything in the internet archive is okay um, as far as copyright goes um, but not really realizing that idea <clears throat> excuse me that um, just because the game isn't available to purchase that doesn't mean it's a free-for-all to be able to emulate or make available um, anywhere, you know, the, the player might want to, to make it available. Um, and that's a really messy gray area too, with a lot of, you know, it depends and figuring out, you know, we have like orphan works, but trying to find right holders, things like that. It gets, it gets um, very confusing. And, you know, another thing that we encounter with um, classroom gameplay is, um, you know, do we have to, I mean, we, should be purchasing like a number of versions of a game like you know through steam for the number of students in our class if we're following copyright that we would use for like electronic reserves and things like that for articles um but is that you know who can actually do that does that mean we should all use just free browser-based games um you know so it's a whole there is a lot of copyright stuff to to consider that's very much in the the uh, librarian motto of it depends. <laughs> so I don't know. I was thinking um, this may be just a shortcoming on my part, but um, with uh, you have a game made in America, and so you're dealing with American copyright system, um, or uh, if a game is published overseas somewhere, you have to deal with, maybe potentially have to deal with that copyright but also it's licensed in the US and so that to me is very confusing but I just don't know much about that but it's something I was thinking about especially because one of the games I'm running about is was produced overseas and so I was kind of curious about could I get sued by the you know a company from Spain or something I don't know well, that's that's a great library acquisitions challenge I would imagine right because you know we're we're just assuming oh well we got you know, our copy of, we've got a PS2 and our copy of Final Fantasy X or whatever, and we're uh, we're all set. But then, oh, oops, well, there's the Japanese release, which has some differences in the, maybe the way music is implemented. Do we need to get that? Do we need to get the, um, you know, uh, every uh, different release? Well, if you're talking about a PS2, that means you'd have to have 
the different regionally purchased, uh, you know, technology that can only work in those particular spaces. Um, and then, you know, with Final Fantasy X, as just an example, there's the, like, starts in Japan, goes to um, uh, North America and Europe, there's that version, then they relocalize it. So there's a Japanese international release that is this sort of tweaked version of that. And so the, the very notion, Tim Summers, I'm sure we'll talk about this later, um, but the very notion of a text is very fluid here. And so it's, it's really challenging um, to think about even what you would acquire as sort of the text, I would imagine, if we're talking about um, a library. Um, and so, yeah, absolutely um, mind-boggling set of challenges. Also, excellent example. Yeah, I was thinking about the first Animal Crossing that had so many releases, <laughs> like went here, went twice again. So yeah, that's that's funny. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I I wanted to plug in like two things. Is um, yeah, like yeah, this problem of copyright. Like a lot of research is being done by copy like librarians um, who are researching on that. Like um, we have at UNT, uh, Mary still a few still researches that kind of thing as taught classes. And I know from Twitter that there are a lot of others. So this is definitely something that um, I, I want to also get my feet into and just see what everyone else thinks. And also for preservation um, and access to video game um, music, or not music, but video games in general, like the, U the University of North Texas Media Library tries to collect like legacy games and current stuff like I went in there the other day I saw a Nintendo Wii and I was like oh yeah this thing existed that's really cool that they have one or I know they have stuff even older than that so I guess yeah just yeah just um I guess libraries can also play a role in preservation as well as letting people just play them so um, I wanted to give everyone a heads up that a Q&A will be coming. So any questions you might have, just feel free to start um, forming them in your head. And in the meantime, um, I wanted to shift into, um, yeah, just general like resources uh, you would, the panelists would like to recommend um, to the audience today. I'll just pick up on what you said a minute ago about archiving and curating um, materials and do a little quick shout out for the National Video Game Museum in the UK in Sheffield. Uh, I know there's the Computerspiel Museum in Berlin. Uh, and I think Will and Angela, there's a number of places in the US that maybe you can speak better to uh, on less familiar ways. Um, I really want to do more to partner with these, these organizations and sort of start connecting the dots, right? That's kind of where, where I see Triple SMG having a role to help join up organizations like that, um, game audio professional organizations um, and universities and institutional libraries um, to sort of better index where these and then link out to where, where these materials are stored and where you can get access to them because there's no like centralized resource or system so it's definitely something that we've been very interested in trying to help connect yeah that's a that's a great point and um, that makes me think of you know, um, Joshua, you mentioned that there are schools or universities starting to uh, collaborate with their, I believe you said, with their like collections of, of, of games and game resources. Um, and, you know, I, I think something like that is especially useful. Um, and um, you know, from the university and library side, um, you know, because I, you know, considering Wisconsin, for example, I know throughout Wisconsin, there are um, a few universities where there's a class or two being taught on various aspects of video games and culture, video games and music, things like that. Um, and, um, but we're all just kind of like we use interlibrary loan to borrow each other's materials, but there's nothing official um, that's created. Um, that's been created for us to be able to to share knowledge, you know, across, um, you know, 
professionals, you know, just like to, to chat with each other about stuff or to work through um, a difficult part in a syllabus where you're like, I just can't get this assignment right and things like that. Um, but yeah, and um, Mark, like you were saying, just organizational collaborations would be really excellent. And, you know, the, like, as William mentioned, the Strong Museum, which actually I didn't get one of the, the research fellowships, but I did do research there. I had, I had to fund it myself, with my professional development, which it, professional development budgets are amazing. Um, anyway, um, so yeah, and there are various um, resources like that around the U.S., um, but, you know, it seems like you really just have to kind of stumble upon them or know there's one somewhat nearby um, so yeah, an official collaboration would be wonderful. I want to jump to a press release, but it sounds like we could put in the chat that there's a project to be done, right? And we've got a lot of people in the room who could start putting their brains together on it. Um, and one other thing just to mention on the side, um, we have for a long time, uh, produced a curated bibliography, um, which is headed up by Michiel Camp uh, in Utrecht. Uh, and that's worked really well because it relies on the community to submit um, new research all the time. And we, we get many submissions um, all the time. And it's, it's a nice to have that centralized resource. So I think there's a good example there of how we can do that, but for other types of resources. Materials. That room. Oh, sorry. Uh, I, I'm looking at the, the 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 chat, and it's reminding us something about uh, emulators as a source of study and how it. I, I'm concerned that maybe potentially it alters the text in some way, but um, I haven't had to use them. I've been fortunate enough to have access to my games that I've been studying, but. Uh, I don't, could emulators be a, a viable option for some of these? I don't know. Uh, I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts on that. But. I guess it really depends on, oh, sorry, William. Um, it really depends on the what you're studying with the game. So for like our um, history of video games class, I don't allow students to play on emulators. We have to play on the original consoles um, with the Atari 5200, so you, especially so you can learn, you know, that some mistakes have been made because the controller is notoriously not great. Um, and so it really depends on, yeah, what, what you want to learn about the game and um, how you want to experience it. And, um, but yeah, I think emulators a lot of times can be an excellent resource, not always. Yeah, I think I was just gonna say, it goes right back to our copyright um, and intellectual property conversation earlier where it, there's, it's really um, intellectually gray area around emulators emulator my understanding of the law is that emulators themselves are perfectly fine but when you're using the roms it's the roms that are are uh, you know violating copyright and so it's a really tricky um the, the roms being the files that that actually emulate the game itself so um yeah i don't know i've used them before when i'm teaching it but but i'm always kind of again in the back of my mind it's this well i better have my fair use argument like planned out uh, we'll see. But sorry, coming back to this, this multiple of these issues, I, something that's always in the back of my mind, maybe this will come up again on the Ludo panel, so apologies, um, is the way that the availability of materials constructs the way that we teach classes, which constructs how we tell this sort of story of video games, right? So. Um, Nintendo is my classic example. They do such an amazing example of constantly making all of their games so easily available to everyone um, that it's it's really easy to just tell the whole story of video games as you know. Well, there was Atari in the Dark Ages, and then there was Nintendo, and there's just been it, there's always only been Nintendo, um, you know. And it, it gets a little bit Orwellian uh, in the fact that we we just have this sort of alternate version of history presented, and it's because it's so easy for us to access. Um, and, and I think um, that's a danger that we run into in all aspects, whether it's performance, uh, we're just going to play the same, you know, 
the same companies that are producing this, Nintendo is another great example. They're really good about producing these orchestral arrangements that you can buy or rent or whatever. Oh, it's easy to do. Everybody knows the Zelda music. We can get the Zelda rights to do this concert. Let's do that versus having to go to all the trouble to arrange this piece from this other, you know, whatever. Um, the scholarship we choose, really classic example. I just did it, Final Fantasy X. Uh, you know, I could have done the same thing with 50 different other games, but I thought, oh, there, people are going to know this example, right? So I just went to it. Um, and so I, I think we're we're in a little bit of a danger of of um, kind of just echo chambering ourselves uh, into this. And same thing with again, what how we would allocate the resources, right? We is a great example, right? You know, what, how could you have a video game archive without a we in it? Well, okay, but did you also have you know these other kind of less common consoles from the same time period? Well, then students can't study those games, which means they don't think they're important. Which means when they go into the next generation and they're teaching the class, they won't teach it because they didn't get taught it. So it anyway, it's a it's a mess. No, that's that's a very good point. Like, there's only so much resources, and yeah, and because of that, then some might get overlooked. And yeah, it's so hopefully, like I don't know, with this with consortia, we'll hopefully have something somewhere at some point. But um, yeah. So let's see. I, want, I wanted to bring it back to the text, but since we're almost out of time, I like the official work as catalogers put it, it's like, what is the exact Final Fantasy X? What was the Japanese version? It's yeah, so that that's a subject for another time, but um, yeah, so let's go to Q&A now. Like feel free to post any questions in the Q&A or um, please feel free to, um, in person people to speak up. Or can you make a comment too, so. <laughs> hey. um, so two, two short questions. Uh, how forthcoming has the industry been on supporting research and, uh, and creativity in, in this area? Because it seems like it would be a, a mutually beneficial arrangement. And then for, for studying video games with, without the use of, of emulators, um, how do you approach the problem of the degradation and obsolescence of the, the hardware needed, needed to play the original games? Uh, panelists, did you hear Mary, the question? Okay, awesome. Yeah. I can have a go at the, the first part and maybe turn over to my colleagues for the second part. I, in terms of engagement from industry, I'd say it's generally very positive um, in spirit. Um, there's a lot of willingness um, in general to, you know, for audio, audio professionals, composers to uh, participate and as keynote speakers or to join panel sessions. They have their own industry events and they, they're, they're very willing to cross that divide into sort of more scholarly community. Um, so I think, you know, we've, we've seen it a lot at the Ludo conferences and NACVGM, um, plenty of people willing to, to, to connect and share uh, expertise in their work. Um, there's some sponsorship, but I haven't really seen much by way of funding research, if that was the kind of core of, of, the, of the question. I don't think we've got to that point yet. Um, and it's, I guess it's understandable that while it's really interesting for a composer, it's a different thing for their, their studio to fund uh, scholarly research, right? And kind of um, going off of that, I think of, you know, with the, you mentioned creativity, um, makes me think of, of mods, of video game mods, and um, how those are kind of somewhat supported, sometimes very much supported, sometimes not supported, um, sometimes by the video game publishers. Um, sometimes they're supported for a long time until the publishers decide they want to be the ones to distribute the mods, um, and then you get into a lot of weirdness. So, um, you know, there's that's one of one of the examples that I could think of. Um, and 
you know, regarding um, obsolescence and degradation, um, something, you know, that that's definitely something that, that we've had to encounter um, and that it actually does make for a really good lesson in um, perpetual innovation economy for students. You know, it's like, why is it so hard to find this original thing? Why do we just constantly demand newer versions of these games or are we not actually demanding them? Are we just being given them? Um, and um, so, you know, I'm actually, I'm able to ask the, um, in, to tell my students they have to play games on the original consoles because I happen to, my spouse and I happen to be collectors of old video games. So, you know, they, we are able to um, provide these old systems and games, but, you know, we have had a lot of troubles with right now with our Sega Genesis and trying to get the students to play that. And, um, you know, there are four, multiple Sega Genesis versions that were released and not all cartridges play nicely on every single Genesis. Um, and like um, as someone in our chat was talking about with the Sega CD add-on, you know, that's a whole other thing with um, having the money to get to acquire those since those are so expensive. Um, but, you know, it seems like the only thing that I've really, solution I've encountered to that is, um, you know, the, the problem of degradation is learning how to fix things myself um, and um, having really good relationships with local um, used video game shops, which, you know, it's a lot of work running back and forth and always talking with them and being like, actually, this didn't quite work and things, but um, that's been my experience at least. I put this in the chat, but a um, couple of sources coming in. Um, I would just point people, um, there's a few people really doing interesting work on archiving game sound, um, but um, Fanny Rebillard is one who's, um, she's French, but working in Montreal and, and doing some really interesting things with um, thinking about the preservation of game sound and what that looks like and in what format we can do that. So um, I think it's a really, it's a, it's a pressing issue because there's going to come a point where we can't fix that Atari 2600 anymore or whatever the case may be, or that I know a lot of um, rare uh, arcade machines are starting to just break down and we just don't, we don't have the capacity to fix them. So it's, it's, uh, um, it's getting to a, a pressure point. I, about the industry connections, um, something I've really learned actually just in the last little bit is that, you know, Music and talking about the larger music industry, there are some really good partnerships out there. Um, my school, for example, now works really well with places like um, Yamaha is a good one, where we send a lot of student interns to Yamaha. They, you know, we have good relationships. They sponsor us sometimes to go to conferences, things like that. Um, and I, I'm not seeing those things in the game industry, and I, I wish I were. Uh, and I, I don't know exactly what we can do to better foster those relationships, but I, I think there is. Um, still some suspicion of academia sometimes when we when we talk about the industry. Maybe maybe that's a mutual thing, but um, I I don't. It's it's hard to make um, effective inroads sometimes. Um, I remember one conversation I went to. Uh, this sticks out in my mind. I went to the game developers conference to do a panel on academia industry relationships, and um, several really great scholars, some of whom are there. Um, uh, in the chat, uh, Dana Plank was there, Steve Reale was there, um, went out to um, have this conversation. And I remember one of the composers saying, we had, you know, uh, fairly well-known composers said, oh, well, you know, what can we do to help? Um, and uh, I, I, the composer said, oh, well, you know, what we really need you to do is buy every student a copy of this very expensive software and make sure the labs are up to date and that you can have, you know, 20 things with the latest version of this on it and just upgrade it every year. So we want people coming out. And I was like, well, that's not, that's not what we do. We can upgrade it every like eight years, maybe. Um, and, and so I think there was a real like, well, they're not even going to try uh, sort of um, uh, aspect. So I, I think there's, there's, a, there's room for a lot of dialogue there that would be, that would be useful. And I'd just like to quickly add, um, you know, trying to get um, video game industry professionals to come into my class to speak has been interesting. There have been a couple of alums who I've 
been able, well, one alum who comes in to speak to our students virtually with no problems. Um, another um, was going to speak to the class, but then was informed by their supervisor that they have to have PR training first. And so, you know, that's another kind of roadblock. Um, and, um, you know, and then, you know, another person did work for a large company but I think maybe they just forgot to ask their supervisor if they needed to have PR training. Um, you know, and the alum has works for a small company. So it's, you know, it's just interesting to, to know the different, you know, what students are or what um, industry professionals are kind of allowed to do um, based on like their contracts and things. So we have time for one more question. And I, I apologize for, I didn't, for not timing this correctly, but anyways, so, um, so um, this question was asked in the Q&A. So how do we entice rich donors to the field or crowdfund a large enough principal sum so that we can set up more sustaining research fellowships and conference travel grants? And this person says, I'm being slightly facetious, but this came up multiple times and there aren't any serious initiatives to bring this about. And Mark said he wanted to answer this live. <laughs> Maybe unwisely, but yes, I'll give it a go. Um, I, I think there haven't been, there hasn't been a lot of progress today, but I think there are, there are serious initiatives to, to try and do better here. Uh, so I, I can really only speak for Triple S and GE. Um, our, our priorities have been to launch a journal, JSMG, uh, provide a forum there, um, and just provide a foundation uh, and, and build some credibility. We kind of feel like we've we've done that phase one, and our team met um, about a month or so ago to develop a our strategy for the next two, three years. Um, and this was a major theme. So, you know, we're, we're not well funded, but we do have opportunities to, to uh, collaborate with multiple sponsors in industry and other partners and, and universities. Um, so I think this is, this is absolutely a big focus and, and we're, for us, um, that's, that, that's not a practical answer to how we actually go about doing that yet, but it, but it is top of mind as, as for what we're trying to achieve as an organization. I think from the university perspective, I think it's, um, we just need to learn how, well, I, from my perspective, I guess, um, I just need to figure out how to tell the fundraising people on campus just how important video games are as a cultural object and how important it is for students to know how to um, kind of read these texts in a sense in a critical way. And once we can kind of get that point across to um you know, the departments that get the money for the university um, to be able to ask the people with all the money. I think that's that's a big hurdle from the university perspective. All right, so we are out of time, five minutes over, but thank you all panelists today for all your knowledge and expertise. And thank you all virtually and in-person audience for attending today. Press start. My name is Blaine Brubaker. I am the music catalog and metadata librarian here at the University of North Texas, and I will be your moderator for our next panel, which is diversity and inclusion. Uh, this panel is sponsored by Spiral Diner, a 100% vegan comfort food diner here in the DFW area. Please visit the location here in the day after the session. Hello, my lovely people. <laughs> so how we're going to start today's uh, diversity panel is just a little context about where this comes from. Um, we did what's called a first chair chat, which is another one of UNT Music Library's initiatives, which is, was developed by Kristen Wolski, one of the other Press Start organizers. And we had a first chair chat on video game music. And 
this topic of diversity and inclusion came up in a very real way. So um, we've decided that for this symposium, it was very, very important to tackle this topic and to have people speak on this topic. So what we're going to do is I'm going to have my panelists uh, introduce themselves just two or three sentences on who you are, what you do, and we'll get started. So let's start with Chell. Chell, would you introduce yourself to us? Hi, uh, my name is Chell Long. I'm an award-winning composer. Uh, I worked on games like Kine and Only Cans, uh, and I'm currently writing music for um, Whisker Squadron and doing sound design for She Dreams Elsewhere. Uh, I also am a mentor and I speak about a lot of things. Uh, and uh, I brought a charity album for Able Gamers. Uh, and that's called the Charity EP Jam, and that's been going on for about four years or so. So, yeah. Thank you, Chell. I know you're in the middle of traveling, so thank you for joining us today. Yeah, I'm still in San Francisco for GDC. <laughs> you're still going. You're still going. That's fine. <laughs> that's why my voice is so hoarse. Oh, no. Stay safe. Thanks. Next up, we have Ramsey. Ramsey, would you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, my name is uh, Ramsey Karubi. I'm a composer. Uh, I've worked on uh, a couple games uh, called Nog, Boyfriend Dungeon, and I'm currently working on Thirsty Suitors. Thank you so much. Again, as we go through this panel, audience, if you have any questions, please put it in the Q&A or wave around wildly. <laughs> I will probably call on you. Okay, so first up, what I really want to delve into is what does diversity, diversity and inclusion within the video game industry mean to either of you? Uh, I guess it would require having an actual diverse uh, group of people, uh, I, like usually in charge, uh, typically if leadership is uh, not diverse, but then like all the employees are uh, sometimes you see some sus things um at least that's kind of how I, I see things uh but yeah actually making sure that um minority voices are heard and understood and feedback is taken into account um and a lot of times uh it if it's not actually diverse uh diverse leadership uh sometimes that input can get ignored which is not fun Absolutely. I feel that if we're going to have diverse groups, we need to see diverse people also in leadership, not just within the working force. It is so important to see diverse leaders. Thank you, Chell, for bringing that up. Ramsey, do you, what does this mean to you? Yeah, I, I pretty much agree with Chell on um, all that she said, basically. Um, it, if you don't replace the power structures that are in place that are in place currently um it's hard to have like a true true diversity um that's but as far as what it means to me personally i really think it means representation and validation like on a broad sense um seeing yourself rep represented in media and validated um you know that's that's inclusivity and diversity in the industry to me um especially as as an Arab, uh, seeing myself, you know, represented in a nice way, <laughs> as the Arab culture represented in a in a respectful way, uh, it is very validating for me. So for me, that's like the definition, in a sense of what diversity and inclusivity is, um, to me on a in a personal matter. But like Shell said, on, um, on the not personal matter, the power structures should need to be removed, in order to have true diversity. Exactly. It's just just hiring minorities doesn't make your uh, mission statement of your company diverse. And this kind of goes into my next question, which in being an outsider, outsider to the gaming industry, I've noticed that a lot of AAA companies seem to be run by white men. And, you know, is it different in the indie game community? I know both of you work in the indie game community. Um, like, do you see much change in the AAA community? Hi, Jade. <laughs> Sorry. 
sorry, sorry. I, I had it in my diary, it's starting in an hour's time. So apologies, time zones. <laughs> no, 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 you're fine, you're fine. Uh, I was just asking, um, I've noticed being an outsider to the gaming industry that a lot of AAA industry people are white men. And is it different in the indie game community? I mean, it can be, I guess. Um, I feel like with indies, there's there's like eight gajillion indie game studios uh, or one-man teams or whatever. Um, so there, there's really everything in between. Um, and so there are a lot of really, uh, there are a lot of really great diverse teams. Um, some teams are, uh, they, they might be like white, like it might be like a like a three person team and then the person who found it is white but if they're like doing a good job hiring diverse people or you know hiring consultants when they need to uh yeah that that's really nice uh also like what you can do with budgets but um i guess it's just it's so broad that like the answer is definitely yes there are more um diverse teams but also like, obviously there are a lot of teams that might actually just still be very, I must say monogamous. <laughs> that's, not, that's not the right word. <laughs> Homogenous? I don't know. Compared to the AAA, for sure, uh, the indie side is a lot more diverse and accepting. I, th I mean, in my experience, because I've only worked in the indie space. So, um, I definitely noticed the indies are a lot more receptive <laughs> or to diversity and inclusivity and um, have much more open-mindedness and much more like, um, I don't know, tenacity to get after diverse programs and things that for, for people, to help people. So um, I, it like if you're comparing it to AAA, then yeah, I think it's a lot more inclusive in the in the industry and in the indie industry um sorry i'm just gonna jump in and just say yes <laughs> um uh just just trying to catch up with context as well um I, and i would say that because uh being indie just means that it's actually quite a lot more accessible and easier just to you know like download unity or renpy or ue and just like play around with stuff and also slip into different communities. So it is definitely more flexible in just jumping in and talking to much more different people. Whereas uh, in AAA, it is definitely more bureaucratic. There's a lot more process, there are a lot more systems in place. So, yeah. I wouldn't have my current gig if it wasn't for Indies. So I would say like on the whole, Indies are a lot more, uh, it's, it's, not that it's easier to get work through them, but it's more, um, it's it's a lower barrier of entry. It's less elitist. That's for sure. Yeah. I guess, I mean, all my work has been indie, so yeah, same. I mean, likewise as well. <laughs> yeah. And you didn't get the chance to introduce yourself. Why don't you go ahead and do that now? Two or three sentences. Sorry, is that for me? Yes, that's for you. <laughs> Sorry, yes, no. So hello, my name is Jade Liam Truskell. I am currently the audio producer at Silver Ray Games. Previously, I've been a freelance game music composer. And on top of that, I've been running several different communities all throughout the years. So um, at the moment, I am the OG founder of Game Dev London, uh, but what started out as a kind of like Game Dev Lunch group. So we just meet up monthly for lunch. And I'm also a member of uh, Pocket Play, so POC and Play as well, just trying to uh, create spaces for people of color within the games industry. And yeah, that's what I do. Excellent. Okay. Now, diversity and inclusion in video games themselves is also really crucial. For people to see a character that looks like them, sounds like them, acts like them, is so validating and is so important. And what ways can we create music that is inclusive or can support inclusive and diverse characters? Oh, yeah, there I go, I'm unmuted now. Uh, simply including diverse folk in your music is like, I mean, just, just doing that alone immediately elevates your game to another level. 
um, especially if your game is about uh, topics that that are focused on minorities or diversity or have uh, tinges from the from that. Um, so, yeah, like um, for the game I'm working on now, Thirsty Suitors, we uh, the main character is a South Indian. Um, and so the music is reflective of the character's personality. So we are like trying to find a vocalist who can sing in Tamil and um, do like Hindi vocals and, <clears throat> you know, um, and an obvious answer would be use like instruments from that culture as well. But, uh, you know, like to, because we can, we're trying to go the next level and get a singer who can actually um, do it justice. I can also jump in and also say that uh, hiring um, composers or a creative team that actually has knowledge of the culture and the context around it is also super duper helpful as well. Um, it also depends on your resources and like the budget and time constraints, yeah. but ideally in a perfect world, you would hire like, like people who have studied like the music properly to bring it like true authenticity to your work and soundtrack. Um, Obviously not everyone has the luxury of like spending five years plus in a foreign country, learning un under so many masters and, and all that. So um, there are ways at different levels to bring true authenticity to your work as well. So whether it can be like, oh, hiring a singer who can sing in a particular language as well, or hiring a writer who is knowledgeable about the culture and context. So all of these layers will ideally add up and yeah, as opposed to just like, oh, I'm just gonna like download some BSTs and make it sound like whatever. It's, you know, there's like, it's really dry and very surface level. But on the other hand, you do have the power to um, input some kind of research and, you know, just bring that extra level of authenticity there. It elevates your game. Mm. Definitely especially if your game includes minorities or people of color or <clears throat> a diverse story, um, you know, it, it doesn't make sense to hire outside of that, especially if you have the money. Like you should hire from communities that are marginalized so that they can be elevated through that. Yeah, I guess, I mean, the only thing I really have to add is just do research. Uh, I remember doing a lot of research for, for music that was like not, I had I had to do a bunch of things in one song, but I was like, I need to make sure I don't I don't mess this up. And so I just did a bunch of research and I asked some friends for advice. Uh, so yeah, or hire someone of of a specific culture if you're doing a game about that, and, or like just do the research. Hire someone if you can afford it. Yeah. <laughs> And money is always a huge barrier when it comes to these things. One of the things that popped into my mind was, you know, getting access to some of these instruments seems terrifying. <laughs> like, how, how do you go about that? Do you try to find patches that sound like the instruments if you can't find the actual instrument? Do you go to certain schools to find the instruments? So what do you do? I pirate all my VSTs. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I don't. Uh, <laughs> but oh. that's one way to do it if you're starting out. Um, I, you know, I think uh, you can you can find communities of people that play um, diverse instruments and try to interact with them. That would, <laughs> that could be one way to do it. Um, yeah. Uh, <sighs> look for plugins on sale that's the most i can say it's that's what's like over the over the years i've accumulated i've acquired a bunch of instruments that can do pretty much anything i need them to do but it's expensive for sure but it's been factored into the cost of my business so over time yeah i don't use live instruments very often um I use a lot of VSTs and uh, they're like sound fonts of basically everything. Uh, they may vary in quality. I remember when I was starting out, I would 
Uh, I think I went on like freevstplugins.com, which I don't know if it's actually safe. Uh, but I, I downloaded a bunch of free like strings and brass and, and you'd get like a, a wide variety of percussion. Uh, if you need like a, a specific uh, instrument, uh, then you might be able to find one. Uh, but certainly over time, I have not use these VSTs really anymore. There's actually a few that I still use, but um, you, you can start to phase out uh, your library over time. Uh, if you do need a specific instrument and like a lot of it, uh, then like maybe it's worth trying to find uh, a player online who, who's willing to record for you. Uh, and, and players are actually like really cool about like negotiating for uh, rates depending on like situations. Um, obviously just try and, and pay people a fair amount, but, uh, if you, there are free resources, um, and I, I guess piracy is an option. Uh, I, I certainly know that people pirate things and then pay for it later once they can, once they have the ball rolling, but, uh, there, there are definitely free resources out there. Um, yeah, no, likewise, I think. Um, just for everyone here who doesn't know, I, I'm actually a proficient taiko drama player and a, a gamelan player as well. So I would definitely advocate for trying to at least maybe watch and consume music of a certain culture within its actual context and culture. So for example, if I was uh, commissioned to write a gamelan piece, I would go into my bank and like, okay, um, there is like a beginner's gamelan course happening. I can dip into that and pick it all out um, because usually what makes your writing and all the instrumentation authentic, it's just the way it's used and the decoration around it. So you can say that you can write something and it sounds, oh, it's in the style of, and then that's one layer and one level, but to elevate your work into another layer is like, oh, actually, if you impart specific writing styles and decoration to it, then it makes it like better and more authentic in that way. So yeah, definitely check out to see if there's any like short courses around your area. Um, anything that is like ethnomusicology is like a really good resource for that. So you can always check out the library um, or the books and you know watch videos, check out courses in that way. Um, and it's also really good to get contacts through that. And then through that, you can you know, talk to people who actually play a certain instrument or sing in a certain style and say, hey, how does this work in this particular context for your project? So yeah, meet new people as well. And how do you think sound design kind of, kind of plays into this? Because with music, there's a lot of, musical sounds that we can pick up through the internet, but there's also, when it comes to sound design, if you're trying to get the right sound of a certain city and you want particular noises, how do you go about doing that? Is it again, looking online? Is it looking at videos? Spitfire Labs has actually like various cities atmospheric noises and Spitfire Labs is free. So if you want London Atmos, uh, that exists. Uh, I think there's also like a bunch of free BBC recordings. Uh, they might be more UK focused. I'm not from the UK. Uh, but yeah, there, there are various things out there. I know that also if you want like specifically city atmospheres, there are definitely like recordings of it. But uh, if you're gonna use something, see if it has like a licensing fee. There's a lot of various things that you might have to research. Sound design is wild too. So if either of you have any input. Um, the, I, th every, I think every year the GDC uh, uh, sound designers put up, put together a bundle that uh, I always download it. And it always has like a ton of free shit, free sound effects, free stuff, free, um, you know, things. Um, so I highly recommend that. It's got lots of city ambiences and uh, like, you know, weapon hits and all sorts of stuff. Um, uh, you know, just like Chell said, uh, there are tons of free resources out there. Um, free sound is a very obvious one, but it, it you know, I, I just yesterday I needed free sound for a project. So 
it's very helpful. I've been using that website for, for years. Yeah, if, if Jade has any resources. Oh, um, wasn't there like a, a kind of like a community charity sound pack going on? I can't remember the name, the name of it, but that maybe might be a resource to check out. Like I know that there are a few like uh, sound community groups out there so that you can always check out. Um, you know, places like Humble Bundle or HIO, they, also, they might have a few good uh, sources there. It's just, it's just a case of like having enough time to research and really have a dig through with all these free stuff. I, I think that's like actually the most barrier for me personally, it's the time to like look at all these <laughs> resources and like shift through all the like really so-so quality ones to really good ones. Um, Oh, you can always like ask your sound designer friends. I'm sure they have some stuff that they have lying around in like a hard drive somewhere as well. So there's always that. So, okay, a little bit of a turn here. But my next question is, and we've kind of touched on this a little bit, but how will the industry be changed to become more equal, diverse, and inclusive? Sorry, can you repeat that one more time? It didn't quite come through super clearly. Absolutely. I'm going to speak up a little bit here, try to enunciate a little bit more, take my mask down for a second. How will the industry need to change to be more equal, diverse, and inclusive? Unions. <laughs> um, get Literally get rid of bad people. <laughs> Make them leave the industry. <laughs> That, that is like a huge can of worms, really. Like, yeah, as Joe says, union have people, like bad people, be held accountable and actually follow through as well. I think, I feel like we're at a part where we always talk about like, oh yeah, we're creating a better industry and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I find that we just keep talking about things and, the impetus is there like oh we're doing this new initiative we're going to like try to bring about change but it always seems to fall flat i feel so i feel like we definitely need a better structural change but also more robust structural change um and also union yeah <laughs> um well, you know i think conversations and dialogue like the one we're having is pretty important like we should have more uh panels on diversity and inclusion um uh you know i agree with jade as well the power structures in place just need to be kind of replaced or people and this is like easier said than done but people need to go and start their own new hangouts away from outside of the sphere of influence of the AAA or the industry. Um, and honestly, I don't think, I don't know, it's going to be really hard for the industry to really actionably change because just the military shooters alone and the message they send, um, like the, it's like a recruitment program of military industrial conquest. So uh, unless that changes anytime soon, I don't know, it's going to be hard. It's going to be really hard for the industry to shift because the message of those games are really like, um, terrible. <laughs> and speaking of that, I'm going to take my mask down again. Speaking of that, um, has there ever been an instance in your life, especially in the video game industry where, diversity and inclusion has impacted you, whether this be a game or a personal experience that you'd like to share? Ooh, that's a really tough one. <laughs> I have one. <laughs> Um, this was a really old game now. Um, it's, it's a game called Sleeping Dogs. Uh, it's a um, like Hong Kong mafia cop kind of, it's basically GTA set in Hong Kong. Um, but I find that the way that it was written with the language structures really impacted me in like a 
positive plus way not not it's not like a huge like oh wow this is mind-blowing i feel so sweet but it's more like huh like i i understood it i understood the characters in the story in another layer which i've never kind of had that before in any other game just because with all the characters talking there was a mixture of english a mixture of chinese and english so chinglish essentially and then pure cantonese and my Cantonese is really, really horrible, so I can only understand bits and pieces. But to hear it sound <laughs> in a game in such a natural way was really kind of also affirming as well, just because I, I don't hear Cantonese in video games, um, not less like a big triple A kind of game like that. So yeah, that, that's, that's something I'll put on the table. <laughs> I'm Cantonese too. Uh, I can't hey. speak, but when I hear Cantonese, I'm like, ah, they're yeah, Cantonese. Right? <laughs> Cantonese. Uh, yeah, same. We, we played like very little sleeping dogs. Um, I guess for me is uh, there's been a lot more and thankfully better representation of trans people in, in games lately. Uh, I feel like, unfortunately, you go through an old thing that is beloved and then there's, uh, oops, that's an outdated transphobic joke. Oh no. Um, thankfully, I think representation has been a lot better. Uh, I have a friend of mine is making a game called Call Me Sarah, which has uh, a trans Chinese girl who runs an arcade. And I'm just like, oh, perfect character for me, hello. Um, and uh, recently I played a game called Butterfly Soup, which I'm still very much obsessed with. And it's uh, about four queer Asian girls who uh, it takes place in 2008 and they're in ninth grade and I was in ninth grade in 2008 and so it, it just hits extra hard but there, there's a lot of things that are both like extremely Asian and, and extremely queer but also just really really funny just a hilarious game um, and so that that's I still think about that game a lot um, yeah Yeah, um, you know, for me, I, I think like I, I mentioned it before, but I feel like Arabs are so starved for representation. So whenever I hear like one Arabic word in a game, I'm like a Arabic. <laughs> so there's uh, but there's also like terrible representation of a Arabic, you know, language. Uh, like, for example, Metal Slug is a really poor example of it, because I think a lot of the Arabic is just it's either gibberish or like curse words. Um, oh, no. Like the, you know, you're walking past the store and the store sign is like, it's diarrhea, but in Arabic. <laughs> so, uh, but there are like games like, okay. So for example, uh, when I was younger, I, I was a, I'm a huge fan of Blade Runner. So I played the Blade and Runner point and click adventure, the old, like uh, back in the day. And um, as part of their world building, they, they have some, <clears throat> cause in that universe, the, every, the length, the world speaks like one language basically. And so, um, so there is some Arabic mixed in, in there. So when I was playing it as a kid, I was, I, I could hear, per, you know, in, uh, peripherally Arabic and uh, diegetically in the game. And I'd be like, uh, wow, that's, you know, that's Arabic. So I felt, I would feel very represented and it wasn't like any Arabic. It wasn't just like normal Arabic. It was like specifically Lebanese Arabic and I'm Lebanese Palestinian. So I immediately like knew the slang. And so the fact that they took, you know, back then Westwood Studios took the time to like really world build their game to that extent, hire someone who speaks Arabic. It's a small thing, but it meant a lot to me when I was playing it. Um, so that's that's one way that I, I felt like very validated at the time. I mean, it's nothing crazy. Like Jade said, it's nothing like, you know, it doesn't, you don't have this epiphany of, wow, I'm so, you know, intertwined now, but it's more just uh, like, uh, oh, wow, uh, I feel seen. I feel like my culture isn't just military shooters or, you know, whatever. Yeah. In, in, the, in the industry, which you three are really a part of, has there been a game that you've worked on where you've experienced issues of diversity and inclusion? Sorry, what, what do you mean by issues? Like, 
it it did it wrong or they tried no. to do it but it didn't work or <laughs> Yeah, something like that. They tried to do it. It didn't work or it was a very positive outcome where you felt, wow, this is great. I'm so glad they did that. I can definitely say off the top of my head, um, Kena and the Bridge of Spirits, just because I'm a huge Gamlan music nut and to hear Gamlan well, done very well, was mind blowing for me. So yeah, that that's just off the top of my head really quickly. Like, Wow, they actually, the composers actually met with the group. I think it's a pseudomanti or something like that. And yeah, they worked together very, very well. And they extracted loads of gamelan instruments and elements of it. And they collaborated really well. And I've been listening to the soundtrack ever since because I'm just like, yeah, this is, this is how it's meant to be done. Right. So I guess I'm... <laughs> uh, I haven't played it but in terms of things that donked up um i'm i i think we all know about sifu's weird um collector's edition box uh and how it was like these eight objects have nothing uh nothing to do with each other i i have a friend named alan who who basically parried it uh in like a european way where it's like a uh like a, a stein mug uh and like a, a protestant uh, or like a Catholic cross and like a Protestant thing. And I think just like uh, some sort of book. I don't even remember. It was just a bunch of like random. Yeah, was it like, like a state flow or something as well? Just yeah, it was, it, was, it, was, it, was hilarious. it was, it was completely true, but it's just like, yeah, here's a demonstration of like a bunch of uh, European things that like don't really go together. But um. I remember reading a thread about someone talking about these various things that, that happened in seafood. Sorry, wow, I just said seafood. Oh my goodness, uh, seafood. Uh, it's early in the morning for me, I'm sorry. Uh, but basically, uh, I, I read something about a character bowing three times to someone in a throne. And uh, I wasn't angry so much as I was baffled uh, because this is uh, bowing three times is something you do for dead people uh, or uh, I guess, uh, deities. Uh, and so every time I go to my, my grandparents' house, uh, you know, I, I, I hug my grandma, I, I say hi to my aunts, my uncles, and then I bow three times to the canon or bodhisattva is another word for it. And then bow three times to the small altar of my, uh, my grandparents and my great grandparents who have passed. Uh, and then like, that's just a thing you do. And so reading that, I, I just got like mad whiplash. So I was like, what the, that's just, it was, it was really baffling. Yeah. And they, didn't they have like a Japanese style teapot within that? Um, yeah. <laughs> they had like uh, pair of beans, yeah. a Japanese style uh, cast iron teapot, some other, I think some Chinese thing. It was, it was the most Asian fusion box I've ever seen. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I don't. Uh, I, pretty much, I could list a thousand examples of game companies bungling up diversity and, uh, or you know, trying their best to uh, present it in a corporate manner. <laughs> but um, honestly, for me, uh, a comp some a company that did it right is I could just use one of my own examples. Uh, Boyfriend Dungeon. They added the the pronouns that you could pick uh, before you start the game. It's a really simple thing really didn't take a lot of like coding expertise or effort on their part to add, but it meant a, sh a ton to the people they added it for. So something like that, a small thing like that goes a long way. It doesn't have to be like a box set with 10 unrelated cultures, in it, you know. Companies try too hard, honestly. Or too little. <laughs> or what? Or too little. Or too little. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they tried, but you yeah. know how much work it takes to Google whether Arabic goes left or right? And and then like every time Rami just tweets like, nope, <laughs> yeah. get it wrong. They get it left to right and it's unconnected. It's like, come on. All they have to do is follow his Twitter. 
I mean, yeah, uh, yeah. you just follow it and you'll see a hundred heinous examples. <laughs> yeah. It's like, can you pet the dog? But for like basic language structure. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of people who create media today, they should have something in their head that like just before they're about to create something, ask, ask themselves, oh, is this the most appropriate way to convey it? Am I like doing it justice? Am I, you know, you got to ask yourself these things because you're about to put it out in the world. Um, so it's important to ask yourself uh, if, if your thing is, is offending anyone at the very least. Since we have about nine minutes left, I want to see if we have any questions from the audience, whether that be virtual or in person. We have a couple of questions. I'm going to do my best to try and repeat them, but I'll have them speak loudly. Um, let's go with Jillian first. Oh. <laughs> okay, so I wanted to go back to the point of the uh, like indie game developers. Say you have a group of developers, or they they were friends first, and then they decided to make this game together. If you have four people who are all white, okay, we were talking about that earlier, would that be seen as non inclusive if there was another group that was not white, but they were all the same ethnicity as well? Does that make sense? <coughs> kind of. That seems to be. Uh, panelists, did you hear that question? Um, the mic on the, Zach, the mic on the left, we can bring it up. It's a little conundrum. They could come up if they would like to come speak. Okay. <laughs> Jillian, okay. want to come up? But essentially, Jillian, what you were asking was like, if there's a group of four developers, like friends who are all white and they created a game, now, the second part, if there was another group that was non-white developers. But we're also the same ethnicity. But we're also the same ethnicity. Yeah. Is that in, like an issue, you mean? Yeah, so like, would that be seen as non-inclusive, like it is when you look at the group of just like four white people? Does that clear kind of what you're saying? So we're talking about earlier. So I was just curious if that would make it if there was still, no matter what race comes together, if it's all the same ethnicity that's coming together, is that still seen as non-inclusive? Interesting. So if you have a group of all white developers and then you have a group of non-white developers, is that group of non-white developers seen as essentially non-inclusive? Right, yeah, if they're all the same, like. If they're all the same yeah. ethnicity. I can start an answer. <laughs> it, it may not be the right answer, but in my opinion, I think at the end of the day, it depends on the story you're working on and the product. So for example, let's say the group of white developers are just working on a puzzle game. It's nothing to do with character. We're not seeing any skin tones. There's no, there's literally no story. Then I guess it, it's fine. However, where it becomes a little bit iffy is when a group of white developers are trying to develop and tell a story of a non-white person, for example, or if they're all male developers, they're trying to tell a story of a female perspective, et cetera, et cetera. Then that's when it, then I would say that's when diversity and inclusion is rated or ranked a bit higher because you are trying to develop a story that is essentially kind of not yours to tell in a way, but again, it depends on the product. So likewise, if a group of developers who are, who are non-white, um, but they are developing a game, again, like a, like a puzzle game with no people, whatever in it, it's fine. <laughs> so yeah, I, I think TLDR for my answer, it's like, it depends on the story that you want to tell. And it depends on the, the perspectives that you need to make that story authentic. And then that's when that question will become like, whether is this inclusive or not? I hope that helps. Yeah. Somewhat. Awesome. I don't know if she's very happy. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. We have one other question. Would you like to come down and ask your question at the mic? Uh, yeah. Okay. Come on down. Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> what? It's fine. Come on up, come on up to the mic, ask your question. Okay, so my question, um, it's very, it's a question I usually have when it comes to conversations about diversity. It's very easy for these conversations to become over politicized or for the politics of diversity to take over the story or the video game itself. My question I would like to propose is what's your advice for creating a good video game while also making sure that the politics and the diversity don't overshadow the game? I mean, like, I just exist. I, I don't, I'm, I'm not quite sure how to answer this question. But to me, I, I always feel like I, I am a, a, a trans lesbian Chinese woman, like, I don't know, I exist. Um, I feel like if you were to ever make a character like me and put it in anything, someone's just gonna get mad. I don't think, th I think there are people out there who just simply think that people like me don't exist. Um, so I guess to me, I, I don't know, is my, my, is my existence inherently political? I don't, I mean, like maybe, but like a story can be a story about anything and the characters in that story can be whoever they need to be for that story or they can also just be a person that also happens to be something else even though if that identity of theirs isn't actually necessarily like inherently relevant to the plot like they can just be that kind of person because people like that exist I guess that's where my head is going to I'm not sure if I understood the question quite correctly um so like I guess the best way to phrase this is I've seen video games that talk about uh, people of different cultures, people of different ethnicities and sexualities, and they've had really good stories. But I've also seen games that have included those characters, but have sort of lost the story in favor of trying to make political statements instead of just allowing the story about the character to revolve around the character. And so that's kind of what I was asking about. I think the media is somewhat responsible for uh, sometimes for games getting like more political than they should be. Uh, the media will sensationalize things have sometimes. So th I, that's a factor, you know, in uh, exaggerating how, how politicized the game can be. Like for like Last of Us is an example, uh, you know, they nonstop wrote articles about it, uh, which is really it's just. Ramsey, you're muted. Whoops. <laughs> Did anybody hear anything I said? Yes, it just cut out for like the last two or three seconds. Oh, um, like Last of Us was an example of a game that they really politicized, um, but the story is really just a normal, it's a normal story. Uh, if you just remove all of the um, <clears throat> diversity checks or whatever you want to call them, it's just it's really just a normal story between two people or someone searching for a father figure. You know, it's it's at the end of the day. So I think the media is like partly responsible for uh, putting people on edge a little bit about uh, issues like diversity and not just games media. Obviously, the media as a whole. Yeah. And, and I guess it depends on the audience as well. Like there are certain games that will cater to a specific type of audience and whether it can be like, I just want to shoot things versus, oh, I want to have a deep in-depth story about queer people, for example. You're always going to get different kinds of product for different types of audiences. So maybe, maybe just to, turn this question around like I guess it depends on what you as a developer want to express throughout your work and if you want to be a developer that creates a particular type of game that doesn't have any of those diversity checks for example that's fine I guess you know 
games like art can be a way for you to express. And if you want to be known as that person, absolutely fine. You can create that kind of product. Like no one is stopping you, I guess. Um, but also on the other hand, is that something that you want to be known for as like a transphobic racist developer? You know, that's, I, I guess the onus is more like on you as a developer with what you want to be known for and what you want to stand for, I guess. So if you want to not politicize your work, then don't. <laughs> if you feel like it is important to bring up a particular topic in your product, then yeah, that's totally within your power and right, I guess. I don't know if that also answers your question. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, I could probably do one more question. Yes, in the back. Um, you can come up here if you want, you feel like. I'd like to. Okay. Yeah, yeah, come on down. Absolutely. I, if I run, I'll trip. Yes, you're fine. No worries. Hey, guys. Uh, my name is Ben. Really appreciate this panel. I actually really enjoyed it. Um, I can't remember. I'm really bad at names, so I apologize. But when you guys were talking about uh, AAA games, I believe it's you, ma'am. I really like what you said about how there's just so many bad people. Because I've kind of been burned on AAA games myself. And so I was just kind of wondering, what do you think we, as in, either as individuals, can do, or maybe collectively? As you had mentioned, how there's just so many bad people, and there's not much that we can really do while they're there. And I guess maybe it's just my kind of my my politics more as a reformer. I just don't know what we can do as individuals to kind of help move bad people out of AAA games, so that way you know people who was who deserve to have their stories told can actually have the funding and the opportunity to really get their stories told. So I was just curious what you have to say. unions uh collective power of workers as unions uh can cease production and cease work until people are held accountable uh also theoretically in contract if there are uh forms of checks and balances of power so that one person doesn't just hold it all uh, and also if people uh transgress what is okay uh, if there are anything in, in the contract that basically allows for people to be held accountable, uh, to be removed from power, or at least for things to be like challenged in a way. Uh, but I think a problem is that so many people just feel really helpless. And I think unions are going to help to an extent. Yeah, I can it's also, a, oh, sorry, please go on. Go ahead, Jane. Uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank you. Um, I, I was just going to say, like, it. I think it depends how much you yourself, you, how much energy you have, because dealing, dealing with toxic people every day is going to burn you out no matter what. So you do need to safeguard your own self as well if you want to be in this industry. And um, like Charles says, unions is a way to, help create structure. Uh, but I think you yourself as a developer, you also have some kind of power to also influence the communities that you build. Uh, if you create a mailing list for your product and your, and your work and all that, you are able to curate a community and say, hey, this isn't actually okay. We don't tolerate XYZ behavior in this community. And, you know, just being, I guess, also being vocal about your personal standards and what you want to be as well, because with with structures like creating unions so that it does take time to build and reinforce and change and develop along with the audience so i guess my my take tldr is like you yourself you can do your own work even though it's a little small step saying hey i don't think this is cool or whatever i hope that helps a bit over to you ramsey <laughs> Yeah, I don't have much more to add. I mean, other than uh, 
your your question is it's like large and it's like hard to answer because it's um, the game industry is kind of like Hollywood. It's uh, impenetrable in a, in a way it's got power structures that have been in place for 40, 50 years at least. So, um, so those, those kind of things take time strikes, unionize, uh, you know, elevate marginalized communities, um, th those kind of things, special programs. There's a lot of things that have to be all done at once. It can't, it's not like there's no one special fix because it's, it's like a big, uh, it's, it's like, it's like a big industry like Hollywood or whatever, just like any industry just can't uh, penetrate through it to easily enact change. I appreciate it. You guys have a good day. Thanks, Ben. Okay. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you all for joining us for our diversity and inclusion panel. Um, thank you, Chell, Ramsey, and Jade for your time. We love having you here and love hearing your voices and hearing this conversation. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a quick couple minute break to set up for our keynote speaker, Akash Lakar. Thank you so much. Welcome back to Press Start. We are here for our main event, our keynote speaker, Akash Lakar. And this, this keynote is sponsored by Quality Time on Range. We appreciate your support. But without further ado, Akash Lakar. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super, super excited. I was pumped when they asked me to come to UNT because some of my favorite positions have come out of this program, even though I'm a Berkeley guy. I'm super happy to be here because this is like a real school. When I was walking in, I saw Sabino being like, there's our practice building. You have a building that has instruments in it. Ours is half a basement. This is awesome. Wait, you, can, you have time to practice. Whoa, this is rad. So thank you so much. It's just super, super cool uh, to be here. So, <laughs> All right, great. Okay, there we go. So a huge thank you to everyone for having me. I'm just beyond honored. And what we're going to be talking about today goes a little bit beyond just the gigs, the projects, the income, the skills, the degrees, all that sort of stuff. So I'm just curious by a show of hands, how many of you here are students currently studying here at UNT? Okay, cool, cool. And for those of you who are music students or any artistic sort of student, how many of you are like, oh, I'm going to have no problem getting out of school and making shit tons of money off of music. This is going to be so easy. Yeah. So we're going to go beyond just those sorts of things. Because I have a panel later today with a bunch of other wonderful panelists about the business, the gates, the skills, and all that sort of stuff. And if you just want to stop me and find me any time today, even if I'm like deep in a work mode, please distract me and come chat with me because I don't want to be doing work. So like, come up to me, that would be great. But we're going to talk about something a little bit different that goes beyond just the gigs, the demo reels, the degrees, the jobs, that sort of stuff. We're going to go a little bit deeper into some things that's going to help you and serve you in an artistic career or just in life in general that will make it so that everything else becomes a little bit easier and a little bit simpler and a little bit easier to think about because there is that dawning thread that all of us get, especially when we're students in a music program, like, oh God, what will happen when I get into the real world? And I'm sure that our friends, family members are all well-meaning, but they ask things like, how does that music thing go? And you just kind of go like, um, yes, while you're just worrying in the back of your head. So we are gonna talk about three things that hopefully will help you and help you start thinking a little bit clearer about some of these things you may be worried about when it comes to making it in your field, whatever that means to you. So those three things are hoping, helping, and hindsight. And we're gonna start with hoping. So a little story to start things off. I'm from a tiny little town called Fredericton, New Brunswick, in the east part of Canada. This is a place where no one knows it even exists. Even in Canada, if you're like, oh, I'm from New Brunswick, like, What's that? Not where, what is that? It's completely unheard of. There is a New Brunswick, New Jersey, by the way, that people are like, oh, you're from New Jersey. Like, absolutely not. <laughs> no way. <laughs> but I am from this tiny, little, this tiny little province, basically in the middle of nowhere in Canada. 
And this is the sort of place, and some of you will probably be able to relate to this. This is the sort of small town where becoming an alcoholic by the age of 18 is genuinely seen as an accomplishment. This is the meth capital of Canada and has the highest illiteracy rate in all of Canada and the highest in all of North America. This is one of those places where hope doesn't really exist. It's not terribly common. But I don't want to keep things too dark because we also have a really fun tradition where we burn couches on the side of the street randomly for fun. This is real. This is the thing. And I want you to see that last picture at the bottom from a news clipping where it says, since I've been a little kid, they've done it here, he said. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's a tradition because my mom used to live here in the 80s, so I mean, should you really stop tradition? <laughs> this is burning couches on the street for fun. And to give you an example of a picture, here's a burned couch on the street I grew up on. This is just a thing you see in that sort of town. You're just walking about, who's burned couch, but you just keep on walking. It's just a normal thing. And some of you are from places like this. But these are the sorts of places where the idea of hope isn't terribly common. You will see people throwing away their entire lives for a quick hit of pleasure in an instant. You'll see people who want more for their lives or want to do something bigger or better or something grander than maybe the standard status quo of that area is. And you'll see people talk them out of it very, very successfully. And they no longer want to do that sort of thing. And growing up in this sort of environment taught me something really important. And it's that hope is not an emotion, but it's a skill that you can develop and that you need to hold on to and revisit over and over and over again throughout your entire life. And the idea of seeing hope as a skill eventually got me to the Berkeley College of Music. And here's me with my very goofy long hair. I have an Asian damn day. I'm very proud of that. But that's me in 2008. It got me to the Berkeley Club of Music outside of that small town where the idea of wanting to do something beyond the status quo was absolutely unheard of. And the idea of even moving out of your small town was absolutely not something you were supposed to or are allowed to do. And it put me in a totally different environment. It put me in an environment where you would see people who are 14 years old who are better than any of the other professors at that entire school. It puts you in an environment where you see the children of very famous household name musicians just walking around. People who have the world in the palm of their hands, all the talent, skill, money, backing in the world. And then there are people like me from small middle of nowhere towns who didn't have any real natural talent to speak of, who are just good enough to squeak into that music program and basically figure things out. I thought this would be the sort of environment where I'd see like, oh, okay, everyone's going to be super successful. Everyone's going to crush it no matter what because we're all here, we're all driven, we're all working towards some sort of big goal for ourselves and hopefully for other people as well. But what I noticed, even in that totally new environment, is that Berkeley has a 60% dropout rate in just the first semester. And it goes on sharply after that. Most people don't get past the third semester. And even the people who are the most talented, most skilled, that have the big, biggest backing, they still drop out. And I'm a bit of a sleuth, so I'll Ask a lot of people a lot of questions. So, you know, when I was trapped in an elevator with someone, a bit talking about you, just this. So, be warned if you come up to me and talk to me, we're going to get into it. But what I learned was that even the people who had the world in the palm of their hand, who were super talented, had all the financial backing, safety net, all that sort of stuff, I learned that even they needed to have hope as a skill. Because if that wasn't there, no matter how much skill, talent, financial backing, anything that they had, they would still quit. The absolute best students that, I, that were there who were, had major label record deals, who had sponsorships from music companies, who were touring around the world, I would talk to them and they'd say, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I have it. That hope matters a great deal no matter where on that kind of spectrum of talent and skill and financial backing you are. It really matters. It is one of the core things that will matter most in your life and career as a creator. Because if you don't have that, everything else falls apart. You can have all the skill, all the financial backing, and all the gates in the world. But if you're not holding on to that idea that you can have a better life for yourself, build one through your own efforts, through the efforts of others, with the help of others, and helping others, then it all starts to fall apart, regardless of everything else you've built up. So hope, on top of that, keeps us playful. When you're staying playful, when you're staying thoughtful about everything that you do, it makes a massive, massive difference because, well, let's get into this actually. 
when you say, when you can make music using an instrument, what's the word that you put in that blank? I blank the guitar. What's the word? Play. play. Exactly. You play the guitar. Obviously, that's the thing that we say. I play music, I play the drums, etc. But what happens when you're in some sort of environment where you are pushed into learning as fast as humanly possible, especially in an academic environment? You are taught to work the guitar. That play disappears because you're great. You are taught to do the right thing, and the human mind just goes into this. This is standard. We'll say, okay, well, what can I do to get the good credit? That play starts to disappear. Or if I do do this play, it won't reflect in the assignments that I'm getting, and I'm going to get a bright grade, even if it serves me late. You're going to see that sort of thing come up a lot, and that's standard. That's just human nature. So one of the most important things that you'll be able to do when you leave or graduate or whatever that may be is go back into learning how to play. You will have to teach yourself again how to get back to that first aid. Working the instrument, working music, that's actually a very useful skill. And you will need that, especially when you're doing client work, you have deadlines, all that sort of stuff. That matters. But that very top skill, play, needs to come back because it will keep you hopeful and it will keep you able to keep your head high when you're being rejected a thousand, thousand, thousand times. And that hope, holding on to it, is what's going to keep you towards where you want to go. Next up, we have the skill of helping others. You all know how important this is. Most people already know this internally. But there's an old Chinese proverb that I really, really like that sums this up beautifully. If you want happiness for an hour, take a nap. If you want happiness for a day, go fishing. If you want happiness for a year, inherit a fortune. And if you want happiness for a lifetime, help somebody. So to share a story about this and how simple that idea of helping can be, it doesn't have to be some grand gesture. Back in junior high when I was 13 years old, I remember a friend of mine and I were sitting in that old dusty computer lab, again, middle of nowhere in Canada. So the idea of a computer was insane to most people there. But we were sitting there and one of my friends got the very first iPod. It's one with the click of you. Well, some of you are like, what's an iPod? Because you don't even remember that era. Oh God. <laughs> but, Got the very first iPod with a click of you. This is what MP3 players used to look like. Maybe you don't even know what an MP3 is. Bless you. Amazing. But my friend had one of these first iPods and was just bugging me to listen to it. I was always into tech and all that sort of stuff, but I was never into music. I didn't actually care. Even if it was video game music, I paid attention to it. I really liked it, but it didn't go beyond that. Because I didn't grow up in a musical family, I had no musical household, I had no people in my kind of purview growing up that were musical. So it didn't really come up for me. But my friend kept badgering me throughout that class, like, come on, listen, 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 listen. And eventually I folded and said, okay, just give it to me, I'll listen to you, listen to whatever it is you have queued up. It'll be three minutes of my life that I'll never get back, but whatever, I'll just listen. But he hit play on a song that he had queued up. And what came up changed my life. It was Hot for Teacher by Van Halen. <laughs> and when that song started to play, I was all of a sudden realizing, oh, I really like music. And I had no idea that I had liked it before. And I asked him, because I was so musically not inclined, that I asked him, do they make other songs? <laughs> Is there other music like this in the world? He was like, oh, he just rolled his eyes. But in that exact moment, I was like, I need to be like Alex Van Halen. And I need to learn the drums, and I need to take that seriously. And you might think that a lot of people have this sort of experience, and they do. They listen to a song or a piece of music or an artist, and they think, oh my god, that's what I want to do. But it goes beyond that. It goes far, far beyond that, because that simple act of him handing that iPod over helped me in a great deal. Because when you grow up in an immigrant family, some of you already know this, you have three options for the job that you can have if you are the child of immigrants. The three options are you can be a doctor, you can be a lawyer, or you can be a failure. Those are your three options <laughs> if you are the child of immigrants. This is a very common thing. Many of you either have heard about this or have experienced this personally. But just this simple act of handing over an iPod changed someone's life. So your help doesn't have to be a grand gesture. It doesn't have to be a $2 million donation. It can be the simple act of handing something to somebody that you think will enjoy. That's all it needs to be. But that help, those little acts, whether it be a smile, opening a door for somebody, 
or handing an iPod over to somebody, if anyone here even has an iPod on them, will make all the difference. And that help will give you purpose in everything that you do. And that purpose will give you hope. And that hope will get you to where you want to go. And lastly, we have hindsight. The ability to look back on all the experiences that you have and reframe them, reframe them in a way that will serve you will make a huge difference in how you advance throughout your life, your career, and how your mindset, how you see the world works. So to give you an example, I have two stories that all tie back to each other. When I was about to graduate from the Berkeley College of Music in 2012, I decided that I wanted to become the valedictorian speaker of that class. I was getting into public speaking, I was pretty new to it, but I thought it'd be really, really cool to at least audition, at least try, at least see how that went. So I go to the audition, there's a bunch of other people there, I speak my heart out, I have a nice little practice speech going, and I didn't get it. Not a big deal because rejection is a big part of this industry. I wasn't too sad about it. I was a little bit me, but it wasn't so bad. But then later, I found out that the person who got the valedictorian speaking gig wasn't even at the audition. It was a sham. They had already picked the person before we did the audition. They already had them in mind. They just wanted to give us the illusion that they didn't have the person chosen. So then I was dejected and I felt pretty bad about it because I thought I wasted all this time. But I went to a coach that I was seeing at the time who was teaching me things like business, speaking, how to talk to humans because I am an extreme introvert, all these sorts of life skills, essentially. I told him about this. I was dejected. I was like, oh, I'm wasting my time. Oh, how dare they? Blah, blah, blah. Super kind of angry and resentful and all this sort of stuff about it. But he looks right at me when I was in the middle of my whining rant. He looks right at me and says words that still stick with me to this day that I still think about over and over and over, basically every day. He just says, there will be more and there will be better. And since I've done two TEDx talks, I've given over 100 talks around the world, and I'm here with you, which is super awesome. But these sorts of ideas helped me a lot because it's true, there will be more and there will be better. And to flash forward just a little bit, you're gonna get rejected a lot throughout your career. A ton, a ton, a ton, a ton, a ton. And sometimes it won't have anything to do with your skill or anything like that. It might just be, they know the other person better or they're charging less or anything like that. It could be anything, but you're gonna be rejected a thousand, 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 thousand times. And being able to keep that thought in the back of your head the whole time will make a huge difference. And going forward a little bit in the November of 2013, after I had left Berkeley, I was in Seattle, where I still am. Now, this is not what Seattle looks like 99% of the year. So just don't, don't go between June and May. So you have one day a year, basically, you can go where it looks like this. But anyway, in November of 2013, I was just trying to eke out a living in the world of music and sound design for video games as a freelancer. I moved there in 2012, I was barely getting started. I was basically making rent every month, kind of. Getting groceries was a struggle. All these basic things weren't really figured out yet. The games I was working on, they didn't really go anywhere, but they paid just enough to where I could survive. But eventually through networking, meeting people, showing up to events, all that sort of stuff, Eventually, a team contacted me and said, hey, we want you to work on this game that's going to be on Steam. Now, at the time, in 2013, you still needed express permission from Valve to be on Steam. It was super, super, super curated, not like it is today, where you can just join in and jump on and put a game up there. So if you had a game on Steam at the time, it's going to sell. That's how it worked back then. If you were on Steam back then, and even before, you're a success. It's going to do super well. So the team contacts me, they ask me, do you want to work on this? What's your rate? All that stuff. We hash all of that out. I go to their office. We have a meeting. All agreed, all approved. I go home, super excited. Oh my God, it's finally going to be my big break. I'm going to have a game on Steam. Fantastic. They email me the next day and say, oh, by the way, someone else from the team who I didn't talk to, we aren't paying any of our sound people. Not, we don't have the money to. We aren't. 
paying any of our sound people. And this was a very fully funded studio. They had all the money in the world. They're backed by a giant corporation that was giving them millions, but they're choosing not to pay their sound people. So because of all the business skill that I learned from my coach that I mentioned earlier, I knew that even though I didn't have any gigs lined up, I had no money, I had basically $70 in my bank account, I didn't know what I was going to do in terms of other gigs because I had nothing else, I still walked away. Because when something like that is clearly abusive, you don't want to be a part of that. Because if that's how they treat you at the very beginning, imagine how they're going to treat you halfway through the project if things are stressful. So even though I had no idea what to do next, nothing else lined up, I walked away from that project. I had absolutely no clue. And of course, I was dejected, just like earlier. But I remembered that phrase, there will be more and there will be better. And just one month later, a game comes along. It's called Hyperlight Drifter. And this was a game that was funded on Kickstarter. They asked for $27,000. We got $645,000. And this game went on to change my life. It hit number one in the entire world on Steam for two weeks. Number one, that's pretty nuts for a team of nine-ish people with no marketing budget. This game completely changed my life and made it so that my career exists as it does today. But this is the sort of situation where you might think, well, that's all nice, but it won't work out for me. We'll get to that in a second. Because the other game that I was going to work on, that I thought was going to be a big success, took five years too long to develop and sold less than 5,000 copies, which is basically nothing in terms of game sales, and lost tons and tons and tons and tons of money. That studio hasn't made anything since. So if I didn't have that mindset of there will be more and there will be better, oof, I might have seen that as a huge barrier. Because when you do hit those failure moments, when you do hit those giant, giant, giant obstacles, you can either see that as a launch pad for getting to the next thing, teaching yourself experience, getting those sorts of better mindsets, or you can see it as a huge barrier and quit. The people who really succeed in any sort of world aren't the people who are the best or the most talented. They're just the ones who stay in the game the longest. That's it. You can't win at game audio. You can't win at music. So a lot of people take this finite approach, like it's a soccer game. Like there's a beginning, middle, end, and end, and clear teams. It's like, oh, now I can win. That's not how this works. This is more of what's called an infinite game, meaning it's something that you need to just stay in longer than everybody else. And that determines a lot of your success. So you can see those moments as a launch pad, and that will make a really big really difference. So just remember, when those moments come up, as they will a thousand times over and over and over, it can happen in school, happen in the real world, happen in your personal life. There will be more, and there will be better. So that hindsight will keep you on track. It'll keep your head held high throughout all of this. And when you're on track or feeling like you're on track and your head is held high, you will want to help other people and be able to emotionally, physically, whatever that means, you will be more free to do so. And that help will give you purpose. That purpose will give you hope. And that hope will help you to, where, to get to where you want to go. So as we wrap up, remember these things. There is absolutely no map to doing whatever it is you want to do creatively. You could follow the exact same formula that I did or somebody else did. You could grow up in the same couch burning town if you wanted to and still not get the same results. There is no clear step-by-step -step map. You can get a lot of advice, but you will need to apply it in your own way. Also, this whole process isn't safe. We use that in big air quotes because really nothing is. You can find the safe career path, but as Jim Carrey says, you can still fail at what you don't want. You can still fail at what you don't want. So there's no real safety in any of this. But you will be told, I'll oh, follow the safe path. But if you feel like death through that, is that a safe? And a lot of people outside of these walls aren't going to get it. They're not going to really understand. Why aren't you just doing the regular thing? Why aren't you doing the secure thing? Why aren't you doing the sure thing? So that's why you need to make friends with all these other people who do get it. That's really, really important. But also on top of that, you do need to hold on to that little spark that got you here in the first place. And that's what's going to keep you going 
over and over and over, clean up outside of the space. Our big goal isn't just to score the biggest games or do the biggest projects or make the most money or anything like that. Really, it's to help other people do the same thing and get the same results that you want as well. Because when you build each other up, that makes a better industry. That makes a better community. And that makes everybody a better person. There's a, a old parable that I really like that shows the difference between heaven and hell. It goes like this. When you visit hell, you will see a giant banquet table with a bunch of food in the middle and tons of people sitting at that table. But they're all emaciated and starving, even though there's tons of food in the middle, ready for them. Every single person has a giant spoon, super, super long spoon. And it's trying to get that food and it's trying to feed themselves and just can't quite do it. So they stop. But when you go to heaven, you see the exact same scene, but everyone is fed. They all have the long spoons, they're all at the banquet table, and they all have the big pot of food in the middle. But instead of using the long spoons to feed themselves, they're feeding everybody else. And everyone is fed and happy. So you need to think about that as well. You can decide which where you live by determining where that spoon goes, towards yourself or towards somebody else. And that help, again, can give you purpose. That purpose gives you hope. You're going to have ups and downs. You're going to have extreme highs where you're like, I mean, thank God, I just figured it out. I'm so good. And then the next day, you're going to be low. We're like, ah, it's accounting school for me. Like, you will have that constantly. There will be a sine wave throughout your career and your life. That's a part of this. That's normal. It's to be expected. That's not something you can avoid, unfortunately. But no matter what, just remember, there will be more and there will be death. With that, thank you so much. I'm honored to be here. Here's all my contact info for all of you if you want to get in touch, but also come up and sing hi to me as well. I'll be around. Thank you. Hello, everyone. We're going to go ahead and start with our next panel, which is our Ludo Musicology panel. Our Ludo Musicology panel today is sponsored by Kava Culture. Kava Culture here in Denton offers the finest kava, elixirs, and botanicals on tap. Feel free to visit them after the symposium for their special drink of the day, Level Up Lemonade. Our moderator for the Ludo Musicology panel is Tim Summers. Go ahead, Tim. Um, thank you very much um, to, for having us. Um, thank you for giving me the honor of uh, moderating this panel. Uh, my name is Tim Summers. I am a researcher on film, television, but mostly video game music. And I'm delighted to be joined by a number of other wonderful people to talk about ludomusicology. Uh, we have with us Will Gibbons, who is Dean of the Crane School of Music at SUNY Potsdam. Um, Will has written extensively about uh, video game music and every word of it is brilliant. I'm um, a huge fan of his work. Uh, Will originally started out writing about 18th century opera and then has transitioned into uh, video game music studies. Um, he's done some brilliant projects. I would particularly highlight his volume, Unlimited Replays, uh, which is about classical music in, oh, thank you, Dana's got the book, excellent. <laughs> which is a wonderful volume about classical music in video games. And also with us is Dana Plank, uh, a musicologist who again has written about all sorts of aspects of, of video game music. Um, I think her work is characterized by putting video game music in a kind of cultural context and looking out at all sorts of things that feed into it. Uh, Dana's work includes uh, some wonderful work on Tetris and particularly its constructions of relationship with Russia. Um, she's just written a uh, chapter for the Cambridge Companion to video game music about psychological approaches to video game music. Um, and has written a, wrote a brilliant PhD called Bodies in Play, Representations of Disability in 8 and 16-bit video game soundscapes. Um, with us on your end in person, you have Jacob, Jacob Collins. Jacob, would you give us a little wave? 
Hello, <laughs> lovely. Uh, uh, Jacob's a PhD researcher whose particular interests are in jazz and American music, and is currently working on a project um, for ja on jazz and the legacy of film noir in the detective adventure video game. Um, with us online, we have Rich Vreeland, a disaster piece, who is a composer, um, and I'm just so pleased to be able to speak uh, with Rich today. I'm a huge fan of his work. Uh, you will know him and his music from games such as Res, Hyperlight Drifter, Mini Metro, Mini Motorways. And while his work is associated with the chiptune styles, his repertoire and uh, stylistic range is vast and very exciting. And our other panelist as well, last but most definitely not least, we have Joshua Derringer. Um, could we give us a little wave, Joshua? Oh, sorry, Tim, what did you say? Uh, could you just give us a, a wave, Joshua? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so he wants you to wave. Oh yeah. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Sorry. That was the That's <laughs> fine. That was, so that was the first level. That's tutorial level, so we're fine. Um and Joshua is the incoming music cataloger at the University of North Texas. Uh, he's also a violist um, and has interest in digitization and the materials. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, our session is um, due to finish at 10.2, but I'm going to make sure we have time for questions and comments as we go along. Um, I'm going to pitch questions to particular people um, who I think may be interested in answering those questions, but do feel free to, to jump in panelists. Um, I'm hoping this can be quite free flowing. I'm going to start though with the, the title of our panel today, which we've been given the title Ludo Musicology. I'm going to look to Will for perhaps have a little thought about this. Will, do you use the term Ludo Musicology at all? Is it something that you use in your writing? What does it mean? How would you define it? Yeah, well, thanks, Tim. Uh, that's also, thank you for those amazing introductions. That was, that was very thoughtful. Um, I do, I, I actually started off quite skeptical of the term ludomusicology um, and, and I've come around to it in, in a more expansive way. So if I'm talking specifically about video games, I say I do video game music research. If I'm thinking more broadly about music in games, board games, tabletop RPGs, this, this sort of relationship between music and play, that's when I use the term, the ludomusicology term. Um, so yes, I use both video game music studies as a subset of the larger musicology. Um, and Tim, I think we talked about this about a bajillion years ago, but I, uh, uh, I, I initially was, was very concerned that it was an off-putting term to people, um, that, that it was a term that was created to sort of legitimize us in the field, but at the same time might be off-putting to people outside that. And so I, I, I see both sides of that still, but um, I've, I've really come around to it. You won me over. <laughs> I, that's, a, that's a really good point. I was actually going to uh, talk to Dana about this as well, because um, Dana, your work encompasses so many different disciplinary perspectives. You, know, you engage in, in the psychological theories, you engage in all kinds of cultural studies. What's your opinion on the term? Um, and in particular, is it a problem that there's this word musicology kind of embedded in it? So my answer is probably not going to be very satisfactory for most of you, but I really just like to say the word. It feels good. Ludo musicology. I like the L sound. I think it's just a delight. <laughs> And so uh, I, I really I really don't have any opposition to using the term, but I, I would basically echo everything that Will just said about um, being specific about the context in which you're using it and using game music studies can be very useful if you're speaking to somebody that's not in the field. Um, it's just fun to say. <laughs> But often I'm, I'm always having to sort of triangulate where my work is sitting and often the biggest problem I have in my abstracts for conferences is situating things within three or four different discourses simultaneously. So having a word that's already a bit of a portmanteau can be sort of helpful there. Um, and yeah, Kate Galloway brings up, we've joked about gastro ludomusicology before <laughs> and, and adding all of these other, other prefixes onto it. Oh, absolutely. I think it's important to be able to, to expand it. I think that's that's a really important point. It's about the disciplinarity and how you can get across with a word that has gained currency that is says it includes this dimension, but it doesn't. That's not the limits of its of its boundary in that in that sense. Um, I was going to ask um, 
that's Jacob, actually. Um, how have you found coming into ludomusicology, but uh, in terms of this area of study, but also more generally, um, as someone who is in the middle of researching a project, is in the middle of developing things, what's your, what are your thoughts on, um, on the field, on how, how you got into it, how you explored, found the bodies of scholarship? Perhaps you could speak a little bit about that. Uh, so yeah, that's a great question. Um, I actually, uh, when I was taking Music History 3 with Dr. Gibbons like six years ago, I think, um, it's been a long time, uh, but I didn't really know that you could study video game music until he showed us uh, an example. I don't remember the title of it, but it was a, like a walking simulator that used uh, aleatoric music. Um, and I was hooked from that point uh, that I wanted to get into this. Um, and in my uh, experience, it's so far, it's been pretty good. Um, and it's the only thing I'm trying to think about is one, um, trying to situate myself within Ludo musicology and then also jazz and popular music, jazz fusion and popular music. And so trying to make that work with like getting a job or, you know, uh, being legitimate in uh, so many different areas. And so I'm just kind of trying to, trying to see where it goes and then if any of you guys have any tips on how to, you know, navigate that, I'm open to that. So, I think that's a really interesting point, and I think that thank you very much as well. I think it is important that we acknowledge the realities of academic work as an industry. Um, that it is a deeply troubled in industry in some ways in terms of job precarity, in terms of uh, competition for jobs, and that's certainly not to. I don't mean that to, to put anyone off musicology. I don't mean that in any way to dissuade people from engaging with it in the slightest. But I think it is important that we recognize that there are very real challenges about how one puts oneself out there for, for jobs and for things like that. So I think what you're saying, particularly in terms of jobs, is is um, is very important. I don't know, um, I'm particularly thinking about Will or Dana, if you have any thoughts on that particular point. Uh, sure. <laughs> One of the I was just about to type it, so I may as well just say it. The two piece, biggest pieces of advice that I give anybody in this field, but particularly in music and academia more broadly, are to cultivate versatility and cultivate relationships. And you're you're going to land somewhere. So I've carved out a pretty alt ac career. I'm doing some adjuncting and and doctoral teaching, but I am also researching, I'm gigging, I am doing arrangements and transcriptions on demand, and I've been able to sort of carve out a nice space where I'm not so reliant on chasing that tenure track carrot. Um, and, and therefore, I've been able to, to do some work from a place of relative safety <laughs> without being in, in quite as precarious of a position as a lot of folks that are on the adjunct circuit at the moment. And I think maintaining that musicianship um, allowed me to have that versatility where I was able to sort of pivot and, and add in some of these other gigs and freelance opportunities and sort of cobble together a career out of that. Thanks, Dana. I was actually going to ask uh, Will if your experience is a little like mine, in the sense that when I initially started, to, I finished my PhD in 2012, when I initially started looking for jobs, I had to sort of really pretend that I was actually a film music person or I was actually an opera person. Um, but I did a bit of video games, but we don't need to be talk about that if this isn't appealing to the panel of people who happen to be giving it a job right now. Um, but now I think that it is in, in a period of time it's now changed. We're actually saying, actually, video games are my main thing is, is acceptable and is appealing in a way that it wasn't. Will, which, which is your experience similar in that way? Yeah, I think it for me, it's really gone from sort of being this like, dirty secret part of of research to being like the the main thing and I'm still a little bit embarrassed sometimes to be like oh actually I do still a little bit opera stuff um but uh yeah no I I think I talk about this not as sort of like confessional musicology but as as sort of a uh I don't know maybe warning thing that you know I did have a moment where I I was um I, I'm very lucky in where I am right now but I uh had a real precarious tenure moment um, where it was uh, um, really sort of finally they decided that my legitimate research kind of balanced out my video game research. So those were the words that that actually came up, um, and so it was it was a real moment for me when I was like, oh, I I sort of thought we were like 
post this, but it was still, everyone was just sort of being quiet about, not everyone by any stretch of imagination, but, the, but a certain group was still sort of um, a little bit like this. And so, um, yeah, I, I think Julianne said this in the, in the chat, Julianne Grasso did, but, um, you know, it, it, uh, it really was unheard of to talk about video games sort of openly as part of the music history curriculum or the music theory curriculum, I think, not, not very long ago. And I, I am very impressed um, with the way that we've, we've kind of turned it around pretty, pretty quickly, I think. Yes, I completely echo. So Julianne's comment to the chat is, it says not very long ago, it was unheard of to have video game music in any traditional music course at a traditional university. Um, I'd like to bring in really um, Rich here, if I may, because I was thinking, um, you know, your perspective, you're primarily a composer, practitioner in that sense. Um, I was wondering about your perspective. Um, when you engage the project, um, you are doing a kind of, um, I imagine that there are, there's a whole dimension of research in a very different way, where you engage with the project, you find out about it, you test, try ideas, you experiment, you develop, and that's, that is, it's a, it's a kind of, it's practice-led research in that sense. Um, so I was wondering about your experience, how do you advance your own knowledge and understanding of game music? Yeah, um, I think for me, I have cultivated a way of doing research that works for me personally. And it's sort of a strange way in the sense that um, I try to do, I try to minimize my research. Like I try to do research, but at the same time, I try not to get too deep into the pocket of the, the reference material that there may be in a particular project. Um, and that's actually worked really well for me where I give myself a chance. I'll give, I'll give an example from, from film because um, that's kind of the, that's where this has happened a little bit more because in a lot of game projects, actually, I've been given a little bit more freedom to kind of explore what I want to do personally. But on films, it's generally, it hasn't been that, that way. Um, so I worked on a film noir film called Under the Silver Lake where um, the music was heavily inspired by Bernard Herrmann. And uh, I, I didn't have any familiarity with his music um, so for me, you know, it was important for me to familiarize myself with his work to some degree, but I didn't want to go so deep that, you know, I was starting to create like a facsimile of what he had done. So for me, that looked like, you know, watching a few, a few, uh, films that he had scored, listening to his music a little bit, and then basically creating a barrier for myself. Like, okay, now I'm, now I'm not going to engage with this work at all, really. And I'm just going to like, let the impression that I had of that work kind of develop in my brain. And this way I have just a just a vague notion of what what I need to do. And then I can sort of take that and, and go with it. And I think what that's allowed me to do is to be a relative relatively ignorant about some of the source material I'm working with. And that ignorance actually allows me to transmogrify uh, the influences into something new. Um, and so that's, uh, that's tended, that's been an approach for me that's worked. Um, that's not to say that that would always work, but, um, I have, I have used that quite a few times. That's really, I think also because you have such an active life as a, as a composer, independent of projects you you may say you you write a lot of music that is not necessarily for a particular game film or that that also i imagine feeds into that um how you take ideas you do the research but then you translate it into something that is quite um distinctively you as well yeah for sure like i, I i'm very um keen to explore new ideas and to to kind of seek out um uh things to be inspired by whether it's styles of music or techniques. Um, and, you know, sometimes that involves, you know, taking the time to actually sit down and, and learn how to use a certain technique. Um, but uh, I would say to this point in my career, I've tended to create a little bit of a barrier between myself and, um, you know, the sort of the, the, the materials that I'm, that I'm referencing. Mm, yes, absolutely. Um, I'd like to come to, to, to Josh in just a moment, but Danny, you made, made an interesting point in the chat here about, um, about knowing when you have enough research for a project. Could you perhaps could you gloss that a little bit for us? 
Sure. I guess this is partially coming up um, in light of for North American Conference on Video Game Music this year, or NACFAGUM, which is actually next weekend. Um, we had been talking um, through throughout the past few years as an organi organizing committee about um, sort of how to cultivate mentorship in the field a little bit and one of the initiatives that we came up with was called wombat which is the workshop on much better abstract tactics which pete smucker coined <laughs> and then i offered to stream on twitch a an abstract workshop and that was one of the things we talked about that um, early on, I think, as a student, you tend to have a paper already written, maybe from a seminar, and so it's already been coached a little bit by that professor, and then you can sort of write up the abstract from there because you already know what your point is. Um, and then you sort of hit the point where you run out of those papers and you suddenly have to propose work that isn't necessarily done yet. And there is a bit of a learning curve there where you need some experience putting together abstracts and sort of figuring out, okay, how much do I need? where I can kind of have a thesis or have, you know, have something, some meat to it instead of just saying, I'm going to look at this game, isn't it interesting? There's music in it. Or, hey, Oumatsu uses light motifs. Like, great. Okay. <laughs> you need something a little more than that. Um, so that was something that we talked about uh, with the Wombat um, abstract workshop. And uh, I think it does take a little bit of experience and maybe a lot of talking back and forth with colleagues and sort of developing those relationships again, cultivating relationships can really help you have somebody to bounce things off of that can say, yeah, you might want to try reading this, or um, it seems like you've got a lot here. Um, maybe you can focus on one aspect of it for a conference presentation or something like that. I, I completely agree. I also feel very seen because my, I think my last book was pretty much, there's this game and it's got cool music in it. So I feel rather guilty about doing that pretty much on this kind of about 500, 300 pages. Um, let's have a chat with Joshua. I was thinking we've talked about a variety of different sources. We've been talking about books and articles. We've been looking at, um, Richard's talking about researching other scores um, and ideas. I was wondering what your perspective was coming in as somebody who is interested in the cataloging and providing access to materials that either give us ways into research or give us ways into new creative possibilities that, that like Rich was talking. I was wondering if you had thoughts you might like to, to come in on this. Yeah, yeah, sure. So I'll just give a tiny bit of background. I completely dived into the field of ludomusicology like around two years ago. And I actually talked with Dana about the field and more of the studies and, and stuff that goes on. And then I was like, okay, I'm really interested in like also including those kinds of materials and for researchers to access in the library be like journals, books, recordings and scores. So at any time they can like say like, I need something on this and then they can look it up in the catalog and it'll be there. So on the cataloging side, it's mainly, um, I, we do a thing called subject analysis, which we basically do a glance of the book and we just say, okay, here's some subject terms that it could be a sign so that when you find a resource on, let's see, role-playing games, you'll get related searches as you deep, dig deeper into the library catalog on more role-playing games. So yeah, so the, so metadata in, the, in my role as a cataloger is to just try and describe resources as um, specifically as possible. So it's easier for people to find what they need. Uh, that's that's absolutely fascinating. And I think this question of finding out and finding ways to identify what you need, uh, I think is really crucial, even before the, it's not on that level of, oh, I want this article, this book, but finding that scoping is, is really tricky. Um, I was thinking about, um, Rich, I was thinking about when you would have been perhaps re-diving into the chip tune um, work. You must have had time where there was a certain amount of learning the kind of raw technique of how to, and I imagine that would have been done through through networks, through other kinds of communities, through that sort of informal passing on of knowledge. Could, uh, um, oh, I might be wrong. <laughs> uh, could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, for sure. Um, it's so, it's interesting because 
probably the primary catalyst. One of the primary catalysts for me getting into chiptune was actually to um, delay my focus on music production and to start with composition. Um, so I basically, you know, I, st I stumbled into a, a, a community of people online who were making uh, video game music. They were making remixes. They were using old video game hardware to make their own music. And I found all of that very inspiring um, when I, around that time. And um, I sought out to figure out how to do something similar to that. And so, you know, I, I had GarageBand on my computer and I sort of just loaded it up and found a very, uh, very basic synth sound and kind of just went to town. And, and for a while, that was, that was my primary way of basically getting my ideas down. Um, and so really the, um, certainly there was a lot of community kind of engagement, um, with, with other people about like techniques and, and listening to things together. And, you know, all of that was definitely happening, but at the same time, um, really there was a personal push to just get my ideas down more quickly and, um, using, using sort of a chiptune type sound allowed me to focus more on, um, writing. Uh, it also, um, unintentionally got me really thinking about music in a contrapuntal way which is not something that I, I had done before that because I was just playing, you know, I was mostly just playing guitar and playing like, you know, this was uh, early 2000s. So I was basically playing a lot of, you know, new metal style, like, like distorted guitar riffs and stuff. But when I started doing chip tunes, I really started writing in a different way. And I, and I really started getting into contrapuntal writing. Um, I didn't really know what I was doing. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't reading, you know, gratis ad pernasum or anything like that. Uh, <laughs> although, you know, I did take counterpoint classes when I went to Berkeley. Uh, but, you know, I got into chiptunes before uh, I went away to, to music school. So, um, you know, all of that to say that it really helped me to kind of create my own kind of compositional education. Um, because even though I, I, I did go to music school, I, I didn't really take a whole lot of composition classes. And so chiptunes for me was sort of like, it was sort of like a teacher. Um, it was a it was a way for me to work on, um, you know, kind of fundamental writing kind of techniques um, on my own. That's fascinating. And just you talk about metal, so that comes back in your your history of the Reland and album comes kind, of, kind, of re, kind of engages with that in a really interesting way as well. So yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm thinking then perhaps um, perhaps um, Jacob, I've been thinking something I've been thinking about, and I don't know if my um, uh, other people here have been thinking about this as well, is about giving pathways for new people who want to research, want to investigate video game music, kind of coming into it, and particularly how you do the leap from how to get into really quite complicated academic texts um, quite, uh, quite quickly. I mean, do you think that there is a place for more introductory work guides to these sort of things or was it relatively straightforward for you to just go straight into um, uh, the journal articles and things that are uh, already written with a lot of assumed knowledge I mean how, how was that sorry that was a very poorly worded question does that make sense yeah I, I think I understand what you're saying like how easy was it to get directly into the Ludo texts and stuff um, <clears throat> Well, there's a, like, because I was reading like a Karen Collins Game Sound and your book, actually, Understanding Video Game Music. Um, there's, there's some technical, like, technical terms that I hadn't really heard before, like getting into like hardware and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but it, for me, it wasn't that, it wasn't that hard initially because it was, you know, it was, Part of it, I think what helped is that it's about games that I knew and understood. And so I was very intimately familiar with the object of study, even if the methods weren't that familiar. And so I knew what was going on because I was familiar with the games. Um, but then uh, I'm still learning uh, more and more each day, uh, but it's, yeah, I, that, that's kind of where I want to end that one. <laughs> Absolutely, because I think there's a really important and thinking about a variety of different things is the role of mentorship. And that can be picking up what he was saying, both personal mentorship, but also through resources, through communities, through 
actually musical materials, which we're talking about how listening to, in this, in this case, game music, thought, make it prompted thinking about music and musical construction in a slightly different way. Um, Danny, you've made an interesting comment here um, on, the, on our online chat, um, talking about um, the role of discourses and other things to, to, to bring in. And I think there's a tension between carving out a, a specialist niche, but without that being exclusionary. Um, and I was perhaps, would you like to come in and talk a little bit about that, about this role of other discourses? Because I, I, I'm, I, I know that Will has heard me rant about this a lot. Well, rant is perhaps too strong. Um, talk about how it's important that it can't be insular. It, 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 otherwise, it just becomes the same bunch of people talking to each other all the time. I don't know, is that the sort of lines you were thinking of there? Well, I can say that Will and I have actually texted so many times that we wish that uh, we all took time back and did more reading. <laughs> and there, there are a lot of opportunities that, that we're missing out on. And as this field, as, as I said in the comment to kind of gloss that again, as, as we get more and more ludomusicology specific research, folks are maybe only looking to ludomusicology instead of uh, before when we were sort of having to turn to game studies and then figure out how to apply that to sound. Um, or certainly I was coming to disability studies and sort of figuring out how to leverage those different discourses. And I don't know that I have ever settled on an answer for it, but uh, grappling with multiple discourses has uh, been my trajectory thus far. <laughs> and so I, I would say that the best thing you can do there is cultivate relationships. I have some some refrains here, <laughs> and what, but one of them is is to really you know develop a a wide network outside of just Ludo musicology. Although those are some of my my closest relationships in the field outside of disability studies. But the more that that you have, um, you know, really great great editors and folks that you know are willing to take a look at your work and give you feedback on it and sort of point you to new directions, along with presenting at a variety of conferences that aren't just. Ludo musicology specific, um, trying to get out into the real world and and field those questions. Well, you can get a little bit of, well, have you played this game types of superficial questions. You might also get pointed to areas of the discourse that you've missed um, in your scope. So uh, it's something that I think is a work in progress for all of us. And to just just stay humble, stay reading, um, you know, try to try to get your hands on as much as possible and then work on the balance from there. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm going to be a bit bold here and say, um, I think one of the things that has been certainly ambition for me and a number of the people that I work with is to um, have a better relationship with practitioners and in, in, in industry folks and really giant those things up. And I think there's a lot to be done there. And I don't think that really that work has, has been done in any um, as much as we would hope or wish it to be. Rich, from your perspective, would you... Um, you know, I show students and we talk about some of your work in our classes, um, you know, being able to refer to some of the materials, some of the, the knowledge that you, both the knowledge that you've gained, but also the details of your, your work, your processes, your materials. Um, what's your reaction to that? Do you think, oh no, I don't want to be sort of categorized in that same way? Is it that you would, is there a way forward not you specifically, but just for industry practitioners to build that relationship a bit better. Would there, do you think there would be any will will to do that? Um, I don't know. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I absolutely think that there there would be. Um, I mean, full disclosure, I don't think I had any awareness of ludomusicology before I was asked to speak at this panel. So I think that's probably a good it's a good example of how there maybe there's there's room to grow into that. Those sort of relationships with with practitioners, um, I do think that there's a lot of value potentially that you know ludo, ludo musicology could provide to practitioners and vice versa. Um, being a part of that process could be very could be very fruitful for everybody involved. Um, you know, there, I think um, there's just there's so many things to learn, and even though even though you know sometimes perhaps you're analyzing things that you know someone like I, I'm doing and it's sort of after the fact and maybe you know I wasn't even maybe I didn't even mean to, to to do the things that I did that doesn't mean that there's no that doesn't mean that it's not the case or that it's not useful to know those things um to to see like you know 
what other people are doing and you know what's effective what's not effective um perhaps like you know having assistance with research on a project that's perhaps more involved i mean all of these things i think are really um exciting possibilities that probably don't happen very often and could happen more often and i think that would be that would be a lot of fun it'd be, it'd be interesting yeah ab absolutely i i wonder if um I wonder if Joshua, if you have have any thoughts about this, particularly about how a library or um, that kind of institutional level um, might be in, um, in a position to deal with various different types of sources and materials that that might be quite different from um, what you would normally expect to find in a university library, or at least the the sort of bulk of what a university library tends to deal with. Yeah, yeah. So. Um... I, I'm gonna circle back to that, but like I, as I want to echo Dana's sentiment on uh, community building, that kind of like place where you can um, go to uh, colleagues, friends. It's I think that's really important, and I fortunately have been having well been involved with Ludo, the little community for a little bit in the library community. I like to hear what they say and then inform it crossover. And I like to just make connections in that way. And also like mentors, like my gosh, like I, so many mentors and people I still reach out to this day, like they have helped me traject, like meet new people and for career paths and everything. So I, yeah. Community is, is so important. I'll, I'll really echo that statement. Yeah, in terms of um, yeah, in other ways in this discourse with libraries. Um, so I guess um, like besides the like formats we're accustomed to, like I was actually speaking with the media library. If you're at the earlier panel today, like. I didn't know that UNT's media library included a legacy, like really like back to Atari type um, consoles and they keep that like more preserved in archives. So like, you never know what is gonna be in a collection unless you ask or you reach out to your librarian, you never know. So if you have any research needs, I, recommend to uh, um, contact um, a librarian. They can connect you to other people. Yeah, community again, like people know how, where to go for, uh, for special, for like needs for your research. So yeah, those are my thoughts on that. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I, I, this must also be quite interesting um, uh, for Jacob as you're coming in with that, both with your but your background in jazz, um, as well as um, uh, sort of uh, media music side of things as well. Um, I don't know if, if you have any comments you'd like to make about that, that kind of blending and mixing, looking beyond the borders, effectively. Uh, yeah, so my, my background with jazz, like uh, the, the project I'm working on, um, there's really not many sources uh, and in, like jazz and video games. Um, there's a couple that I'm drawing from, but it's more from the lens of popular music. And so I'm using jazz film studies basically uh, to work on this project and related to that. So that was very interesting uh, to do. Uh, I always I always tell myself uh, at, at some point in my career, I'm gonna write the uh, video game version of uh, Jammin' at the Margin, uh, Corinne Gabbard's book, but uh, that's neither here nor there, but that's kind of, it's yeah i have to adapt from a lot of different places so absolutely and i think we we have knowledgeable practitioners out there finding ways for them to communicate what they do and what they understand um and it might be that there are many people who want to you know, write a book which is the sort of default mode for those of us in the academic institution but there are lots of people with great knowledge skill understanding for whom other formats other methods i think that's something that we Need to challenge ourselves to to to, to do. Um, I was going to ask a little bit of a provocative question, and this is aimed, I suppose, primarily at Will and, and Dana. Um, where do you think this sort of academic study um, 
should go next. I'm thinking particularly of whose voices are we not hearing? Where are the gaps? Um, what um, and what, if anything, are we to do about that? Is there a, is there a next challenge? Is there another thing that we have to really consider quite carefully um, about what's not what's not appearing on that on that radar? Um, I don't know. Will, do you want to go first? Then we we'll go, Dana. Sure. Um... That is a great question, uh, Tim, and I think it's it's where I am right now. A lot of my time is just sort of staring off into space thinking about this. And so, you know, I'm working on a, a project right now in sort of early phases with um, Karen Cook, who is in the chat here, and um, Fanny Rebillard, um, who's a, a game scholar and archivist. And, um, you know, we're trying to look at game music from more of a global perspective um, and 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 look at it not so much as as a regional project as we as we do and 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 there are just whole continents where it's basically impossible to find anyone or very difficult to find someone who's working on this and you know we've talked in some meetings tim where you've been there about you know the challenges of finding um japanese scholars of game or you know connecting with this or you know there's this um, very active group in South America that we would like to connect with, but I, we can't even find email addresses half of the time to connect to try to collaborate on projects. And, you know, so to my mind, I think the field needs to sort of decenter itself from being very um, uh, Western Europe and North America focused and to think a little bit more um, globally. That's my sort of number one aspect. And with that, I think. Um, uh, at the same time, I think we need to think about the diversification of who is writing, uh, making sure we're creating adequate um, pipelines for younger scholars um, to sort of find on ramps. I actually think the field is doing fairly well um, from a gender um, perspective, not very well from a, a race and ethnicity perspective. And, and so I think that's uh, it's really something to engage with some sort of big questions about why that might be and 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 where we are. So. That's, I mean, I could keep talking about this for a while, but those are two of the things that sort of keep me um, uh, keep me up at night, especially from a perspective of not kind of replicating the sins of musicology old um, and sort of not having to create these giant walls and then tear them down. Is there a way that we can sort of just stop building them in the first place um, and, and, and work that way? Absolutely, Dana. So one, I, I have a lot of optimism in general about the about the field and where it's going. And uh, right now, we are starting to see more and more folks find employment and finish dissertations in the field and sort of move into the positions where they're going to be able to create some of that change through recruiting and um, mentorship, certainly uh, advising, you know, dissertations on on all of these topics and in encouraging conference uh, participation and, and things like that. Um, but I, I know it can feel really difficult when the field is largely young, untenured, precariously employed folks. We sort of feel like we, we're trying to <laughs> find, our, find ourselves in a better position where we're going to be able to then lift up others. Um, like I, I'm an adjunct at the moment, so the amount of advising that I have access to is almost zero. <laughs> And um, and that's where it's really important that the field engages with pub public musicology, I think, is one one avenue that we can sort of start to not only have these conversations with fan communities, as we've been talking about in chat, um, and just leverage all of that incredible embodied knowledge um, of, of those folks and interfacing them with what we do, but also bringing them into the field and um, giving them that sort of academic rigor and background. Um, and kind of going that way. I, I think it's sort of a keep an eye on this space and, you know, let's let's see what we can do to sort of promote uh, folks getting into positions where they're going to be able to then turn around and, and lift up and, and promote and um, just increase, you know, what is already a, a pretty good trajectory in terms of inclusivity and, uh, you know, creating a, a really wonderful, rigorous, space but that is one that folks want to join and become a part of yeah i, I couldn't agree more and i think actually that sense of community um first of all with, with the fans but also with the you know, as, a, as a area of scholarship i think <clears throat> it comes back to something that i think you mentioned earlier dana is that we can use that 
collegiality to hold each other and say and, and to challenge each other in the best possible way. Because I know if if I write some nonsense and Dana says, hey, look, you've written some nonsense, it's not good because she hates me. I mean, she may do. I don't think so. Um, but it'll be because, you know, the, we want to expect each other to be good at it. Um, and we want to be open. And that works on the, on the level of the scholarship, but also in these kind of broad questions of access, mentorship, and all the rest of it. Um, and so I think perhaps that community can uh, not become exclusionary, but help more with that, that sort of hold each other well. Um, I'm conscious of the time, um, and I've spoken an awful lot, uh, which is a, always a danger with me. Uh, I'd like to open up for questions from anybody in the audience. Um, so while we, maybe you might be thinking of a question, uh, or indeed any of our panelists who want to ask of each other, but I'm going to start though with answering uh, a question that's come up in our Q&A, which is from Joseph Messick, who's saying, um, what are some good opportunities to connect with non-research oriented industry folks? Um, my instinct to answer is that is is at um, is at conf um, industry facing conferences and things like that is a good way to connect with non research oriented industry folks. But I don't know if anyone else on the panel would like to like to come in on that. Yeah, I would say um, you know if you go where the if you're trying to if you're interested in meeting with practitioners, you go where the practitioners are. Um, the Game Developers Conference is a great is a great example of a place to go. There's also smaller um, game audio uh, themed conferences like the ga uh, Game Sound Con, which happens every year in Los Angeles. Um, if you're interested in me meeting people who are working in music and games, those are those are great places to go. Yes, thank you for the shout out to, to those institutions as well, who have also just for clarity, have also been a particular Game Sound Con have been great about wanting to engage with the academic community. And I think, Dana, you know, you've done uh, something for them. Uh, yeah, GSC, I'm actually the head of the academic track along with Matthew Thompson, and we we try really hard to not only have scholars on our track, but also practitioners who are sort of employing research. Uh, so like last year, we had Christopher Madigan speaking to his work on Cuphead and sort of the, the research that he did there. So we're, we're really trying to make that a space where we can have some of these, foster some of these relationships. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions? Um, do pop them in the chat if you're online, or I might need some assistance, Mike, because my, my arms aren't long enough to reach a microphone round to Texas. So if anyone there has a has questions, uh, perhaps I could ask for one of our wonderful organisers to help facilitate. I have sort of a question um, and sort of a open ended topic for maybe to start with Rich, if that's OK. Um, and that's, you know, I remember a couple of years ago, actually, maybe at the first NACVIGM, North American Conference Video Game Music, um, Casey Collins was the um, speaker, the, and, and she, she said, um, you know, one of the things that's so unique about our field is that basically everyone's still alive who's a, a, a practitioner and that, you know, we should really be taking advantage of that. And I, I think on that a lot. That maybe we have not um, done a great job taking advantage of that, and so, um, you know, we, when we think about writing about Mozart, Beethoven, whoever, um, you know, Amy Beach, whoever we want to think about writing about in the sort of classical realm, they're they're gone. We can't ask them questions, but we could ask you questions. Um, and I know, as a as a historian, it makes me extremely nervous to think about doing that. Um, and I just think, you know. Um, you know, anytime I think, well, what if they, you know, I send them something and they just write back, well, this is dumb and also don't write about my work. And then I have this sort of ethical dilemma of like, oh, shoot, and I don't want to write about something they don't want me to write about. And then, it, you know, what what's your feeling? And, and I don't know, you know, is that the kind of collaboration you would be open to not asking you to speak on behalf of all composers, but, you know. No, it's absolutely something that I personally am open to. I mean, I can't imagine that anybody would shut you down in, in the way that you just described. I mean, it, it is true that there are some people who are very busy and perhaps, you know, perhaps they might not get back to you. But for someone like me, um, I've always tried to prioritize uh, sharing knowledge. Um, you know, if you if you go to my website, for instance, it's very I try to go very in depth in all the projects that I work on. Um, I, I do a lot of interviews. Um, I just generally want to share kind of the process. I want to share like my experiences and the process behind the work that I do, because I think it's valuable to share those things. Um, and I wish, you know, I wish more people would do that. Um, so yeah, I mean, it it's to, 
to to work with people who are are doing this on such a at such a high level i think is very it's a very exciting prospect and i think it could be nothing but but positive to you know to just um kind of sp spread the knowledge because it's you know it's valuable to so many people i think to um, be engaging with uh, these sort of um, lessons and and uh, and experiences, uh, you know, whether it's in your field or whether it's um, you know part practitioners, uh, game developers uh, are often very interested to to learn more about how the you know the music aspect of things works. Um, as an example, so um, there's quite a lot of um, potential there. We have one question from an audience member. <laughs> Let's go for it. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Hi. Yes. Yes. Please. Please go for it. Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, Drew Berecki. Um, Will, it's good to see you again. Uh, Melissa Camp says hi. Um, uh, there was an interesting uh, topic that you all brought up about legitimization in the field, which, as a as a new scholar, relatively new, I get older every day. Um, uh, there is pushback against uh, legitimization, not only on kind of the musicology side, but within musicology, uh, I kind of wanted to ask where uh, you feel the, the place of interdisciplinarity lives uh, outside of music. Um, a lot of members of our field are going into geographies, world studies, American studies, and things like that, um, where uh, it seems to be embraced more so than within a traditional musicology or even in traditional media studies. Um, so where are uh, this kind of feeling around with that question is um, how do we bring in geographies and things outside of Ludo into Ludo? That's a fantastic question. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to not answer that because I think I'm coming from quite a different sort of institutional kind of context. So I was wondering if um, whether um, perhaps even Jacob, if you might like to mention perhaps even just briefly, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I wondered if you might have a thought about this because of your entryway into it. But don't worry if you don't, I don't mean to say, ask the question. Um, do you have anything you'd like to share about that? Well, I, I think the, the most important thing that we can do is like increase awareness of this thing and just kind of the whole a, a, a yes and attitude where it's like, can I study, you know, geography in, you know, Legend of Zelda or whatever, hypothetically, whatever, say, okay, yeah, sure. Um, you know, um, because it's like, like me, I was completely unaware that you could really study this until it was presented to me right in front of my face. And so I think if more people knew about it with the public facing side, um, then I think more people would join. And I mean, it's, it's already incredibly very interdisciplinary. And I only think that we could benefit by adding more, basically. Yeah, thank you very much for the answer. And I think also that perhaps um, uh, with, with Joshua's position in a library as being very well placed to make those connections, because presumably, you, even though you have a subject specialism, um, Josh, you must work very closely with your colleagues in other, other subjects as well, yes? <laughs> so, yeah, I feel like, well, I'm coming in as, as the connecting Ludo and libraries and just seeing what can, conversations can happen. Like libraries can like talk, like, what do you like, what do you exactly like would like a collection to have? Or like, what kind of sources do you want available? So yeah, that's where I'm coming from it. Just trying to connect those two things together. Thank you. I think um, just before we move on, um, Will or Dana, do you have anything you want to jump in on this? Or should we move on? Yeah, I, I would just say that well beyond the bounds of this panel. I mean, the, the North American university system is structured in such a way to make interdisciplinarity as difficult as possible. Um, it, it's just the way that, you know, the sort of early 20th century major department model was sort of constructed. And it's really, really difficult to, um, to overcome that. And I think I agree that libraries can be a really useful hub 
um, and sort of seek those kind of, kind of interdisciplinary centers where you can. And my old institution in Texas, um, uh, you know, I, I, it took me about five years of working there to realize that there was um, two people in the English department that wrote about games. And there was someone in, um, you know, film, TV, digital media that was working on games. And there was, you know, so there's about 10 faculty members who were working on video games, each thinking they're the only person doing that on campus because um, there was just no kind of collision space to encourage that, that sort of connection. And so um, I, I do think, again, libraries, um, uh, even student success centers, all sorts of those interdisciplinary hubs on campuses can, can really provide um, useful resources to connect students who are interested in, in similar topics, faculty who are interested in, in similar topics, and, and kind of make things happen, even if there's no money associated with it, which there should be. Um, but even if there's not, I think just creating those spaces for conversations is, uh, is essential. Thank you so much. Well, I, I, my eye is on the, on the clock here, so I feel like I should uh, possibly draw this to a close. Um, but I'm, I'm sorry, there are some questions that I haven't had the opportunity to, um, to answer um, in the chat, um, and I apologize for that. Um, there was a great question from uh, Frank Lehman about, um, about uh, pedagogy and about how looking out to be encouraging people to explore other kinds of repertoire, both beyond and through music. And a lovely um, question uh, from Trinity, which was about um, opportunities for internships and so looking out for possibilities um, both in game companies, but also networking with developers is the way forward. I should finish talking now. I've already gone over. I apologize. Thank you so much to everybody for engaging with us today. Thank you for you being there um, in the room. I'm sorry I can't be with you. Thank you so much to, to Will, to Dana, to Rich, um, to Jacob, and to Joshua for this lovely panel. Thank you to the wonderful folks at uh, University of North Texas Library for convening this panel. Uh, and thank you very much to everyone for engaging. Thanks so much, all. back for our technically our final panel of the day which is working in the industry which is sponsored by your box entertainment your box entertainment just came out with tiny tino's wonderland the other day and it is out for playstation xbox and pc so give it a give it a look it's on those platforms so what we would like to do is go ahead and start this panel and I'm going to turn it over to our Stephen Sellers here from UNT to start it off. Go ahead, Stephen. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Working in the Industry panel for the day. Um, as Blaine mentioned, my name is Stephen Sellers. Uh, I'm a student here at UNT and I will be moderating our panel for the day. Um, we're going to start off with having our panelists introduce introduce themselves, and then I'm going to ask some questions, and while I'm doing that, you can be thinking about your questions that you're going to ask. Make sure to write them down and put them in the chat if you are here virtually. Uh, so let's start with uh, Neha. Um, if you would mind giving us a brief uh, introduction and then pass it off to the next person, please. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Neha. I'm a freelance composer, sound designer based in Montreal, Quebec City. Uh, I'm really work mainly on indie projects, most currently Mini Maker, Venba, um, some stuff for the Playdate, and uh, the NDAs, of course. Uh, and yeah, I'll pass it on to Ramsey. Yep. My name is Ramsey. I'm based in New York, uh, freelance composer as well. Uh, worked on a few projects, um, Nog, Boyfriend Dungeon, and currently I'm working on Thirsty Suitors. Uh, Rich. Hi, I'm Rich Freeland. Um, I uh, make sound and music uh, under the name Disasterpiece for games, film, TV. I've worked on games such as Fez, Hyperlight Drifter, Mini Metro, Mini Motorways, and Reigns. Um, and uh, yeah, happy to be here. Well, I guess I'll pass it back to the people who are there in the flesh. Uh, Akash, go ahead. Cool. Uh, my name is Akash Lakar. I'm a sound designer based out of Seattle, Washington. I've worked on games like Hyperlight Drifter and a whole bunch of others like Outer Wilds and Destiny and tons of others under NDA, of course, just like Neha said. And also, um, I really focus on helping people within the field of music and sound make money of what they do. Hi, I'm Mark Petty. I'm the audio director for Gearbox Software. I've uh, been there, well, been there for total 15 years. Um, all the way from uh, Brothers in Arms to Tiny, Tiny Tina's. 
Uh, so all the Borderlands series, uh, Battleborn, um, all of them. <laughs> uh, yeah, and that's me. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, panelists, for joining us today. Our first question is, what is the most important thing to know if one wants to be a video game composer or sound designer? It's the softball to start, huh? Mm -hmm. It's the easy one. Yeah, right. <laughs> Just tell us all the trade secrets, you know, give us a direct path of how to just be awesome. <laughs> I, I guess I'll start. Um, and this isn't the only thing by any means. It's just something to think about is that this is a business. And if you are, especially if you're doing this as a freelancer, you are a business. And that is something to consider. It is, isn't just about, you know, making great music and great sound is a really important thing. But you also need to treat this as a business to make sure that this is something consistent because businesses have systems that have replicatable results over and over and over again. That's why Apple keeps succeeding. So having that sort of mindset and building that into your workflow, your life is really, really important to making it so that this can be a career for you. Um, I'll go. Um, I think one of the important things uh, I think upon entry is understanding that interactive media is a different set of tech. Um, the way that things play back, whether that be sound design or music, um, can be different than linear, um, outside of understanding the DAW and the, the, the straight tools to actually come up with the composition or the sound design itself, like understanding how that's broken apart and played back in game, because it affects the decisions about how that content is authored. Um, uh, I get a lot of a lot of uh, resumes from guys on film post and some guys I'm like, man, that, that guy's awesome. Like I've heard his work, um, but like I need a, a senior and I need him to step in and just be effective, but he doesn't understand anything about the tech. So, um, so yeah, I would say that's, that's super important is, is making that connection. Gotcha. Virtual panelists, do you have any thoughts? I agreed with uh, Akash a lot um, as a freelancer, especially working on your craft is great. And that I'm going to assume that that's our passion, but sustainability is, is very important to me. So understanding how much charge, what is the norm in the industry? Um, for me, that's that's like, a, you can't get past by that. Um, also understanding the realities, especially the financial aspect of what it is to be a freelance composer, sound designer, and how to take the steps so that you can continue that career sustainably. Um, I mean, talking about rates and such is a whole other subject. Um, but yeah, like it's not just making, I mean, it would be great if I could just, you know, stay in my room and write music all day, but that's not true. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, I want to reiterate what Akash and Neham basically said, um, but setting a value on your work, just making sure that it's um, en enough to get paid. But since, you know, freelancers and so many of us are freelancers, um, they so often are liable for extra costs like uh, our own healthcare, um, you know, travel to conventions or talks like this, um, among other things like also our own gear to make music and stuff like that. So you have to factor that into your cost or make sure you're getting something out of the deal that is sustainable. If I knew that when I started out, like to the extent of it would have really helped. I think all I can add to every everything that everybody said, which I agree with is just that um, it's hard. Uh, you, you, especially um, doing music, um, you know, there's less opportunities uh, that are going to be like in-house somewhere. So you're more likely to be a freelancer. And so you're gonna have to wear a lot of hats um, and, uh, you know, certainly at some point you could potentially, you know, work with other people to help you navigate certain aspects of that, whether it's, you know, the financial side or whatever. But um, in the beginning, it's definitely, you know, you're gonna have to learn a whole lot um, in a lot of different areas. Um, so uh, it's, it's definitely, uh, you know, you really have to love it because uh, there's, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of juggling that you have to do. Thank you. Uh, our second question is, what is your favorite part of the composition or sound design process? Uh, I would say for me, the my yeah, favorite part. Start on this one. Uh, I'm a classically trained pianist. So the way I write music. <laughs> I think she froze. Oh, latency. Uh -oh. <laughs> Sorry. Nah, nah, go ahead if you want to kick it off. <laughs> Whoa. 
Uh, or maybe not. Mark, why don't you pick oh, up, please? Uh, I think for me uh, and my team, uh, one of the things that we really enjoy is uh, sort of the pre-production phase where we get the uh, design documentation and the artwork for a lot of the creatures and the characters and the other things that are going in the game. And we build palettes for that. Um, that part is super fun because you're not confined uh, to any type of deadline. It's like a free space to run around in. Um, and you can just you can just think, man, like today I'm going to record... I'm going to freeze some genes and I'm going to crack them, you know, and, and that's going to be this thing. And then I'm going to process, you know, and it's, it's like, it's so much fun. Like that's, that's the creative space because so much of the, the actual production end of it uh, is, is tasks and deadlines and those kind of things. And like front loading that kind of work is uh, super, super helpful, but, but, um, but yeah, it's, yeah, it's just like a free reign to be creative. And it's awesome. Anyone else want to jump in on this one? Sure. Um, for me personally, like my favorite part of the composition process is uh, just when I get the first few notes down or the first whatever of something, um, as I continue to work on it, I, I feel like it kind of, I don't know, I don't know how a better way to put it, but it kind of like reveals itself in a way, like you just keep uh, chipping away and then eventually you have something and then when you have something that forms a narrative that's my favorite part so like I start I can start to see the story in my head with a concept that I'm uh, I'm you know laying the foundation for so I you know once I start to see that narrative and I'm like oh yeah that'll sound cool or that'll be cool in the game or you know whatever um, that's my favorite part personally that's what what drives me gets me passionate about it the final product is. I would say for me, it's um, when you actually put the thing that you made into the game and you really get to experience it in context. And that's that sort of like, that sort of iterative loop that you get into. Um, I really like that part of, of, the, uh, of, of the work um, when it goes well. Because <laughs> that's also maybe one of the more challenging parts of it. But when it works, it's very, very satisfying um when you know you you've done all this work sort of like in your own like separate environment and then you actually bring it into the thing that you're working on um yeah i just love to throw things into the game and like you know see see how they work whether that's good or bad um because that's kind of where that's where i you know where i learn i think a lot about um what i'm doing yeah i think it's for me it's similar to what mark said where it's that initial phase of just making stuff and something I've gotten like into more recently is making absolute garbage sound toys, basically. Like I'm gonna glue a GI Joe onto a flute and see what it sounds like, <laughs> I don't know. And then money appears, that's the best part because as long as no one knows what we do, right? That's the secret about it, it's just to tell them what we do. But yeah, I like I really like making those kind of silly tools and be like, oh, that actually sounds really cool. This electric kazoo sounds rad. Or, Recently, I glued a slinky onto a solo cup and turned and put a guitar pickup on it. Now it's literally a spring reverb. So it's a silly, very, very silly sort of process that can be a lot of fun. And it keeps that um, playfulness throughout that whole process when you can do that. Does your favorite part of the process change depending on the game or the project that you're working on? Or does it stay relatively consistent? Generally speaking, for me, it stays consistent. Uh -huh. uh, it's usually that phase of that initial exploration. But there are times, like sometimes it's similar to Rich, where it's like, oh, it's in the game, and I put that there. Mm -hmm. Neat. So it, yeah, it kind of does shift a bit, but usually it's that like conceptual phase. It's super fun. Yeah. Yeah, I would, I would agree. Like, it's almost like I have a bucket for each part of the process, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so the pre-production phase and being free to be uh, sort of creatively roam is a thing, but once you get in the production, I agree with um, what was also said, which is, you know, like that iterative loop of getting something in the game, seeing it work, seeing it come to life. Uh, and, and also um, like the next process is a big um, win for me because that's another part of that iterative loop where you have all the content and now you're starting to manipulate and move things around. You're starting to see a picture and starting to tell a story. Um, uh, and that's, that's an exciting part of it as well. Mm -hmm. I will say that like the, the, 
the most exciting part of the process can change from project to project because sometimes you're going to work on a project where there are going to be um you know there are going to be areas of that experience that are maybe less than ideal like sometimes that you know the actual process of like getting stuff into the game you know depending on what your sort of pipeline is it, that, that could be fairly uh that could be a fairly frustrating part of the process um but sometimes you work on games where it's really easy to get stuff in there and so you know that's sort of like what i'm imagining when i'm thinking like oh what's the best part of the experience is like if it's a game where that that loop is really short and you can really get things in quickly then that that can be really fun um but if there's more of a barrier there then um you know obviously you try to work towards making that less of a barrier um but uh i think probably on those projects i'd be more inclined to say like the ideation process um the, as, as others have mentioned um is is pretty fun just kind of exploring what you're what you're going to be doing for the next however long period of time. Mm -hmm. Neha, I wanted to give you an opportunity to respond since we were having some technical issues there. Do you have a favorite part of the composition process and does that stay consistent uh, or does that change depending on the game? Uh, uh, so yeah, what I was writing was that um, I trained as a pianist. Uh, so like improvising for me is super important and that's how I write all of my music. It's just pure improv. And from that, I'll go into my DAW and that's that's the less fun part. I, I just hate having to like, you know, fit everything in and like trying to make it sound good with fake instruments. But um, the best part for me for sure is when I get to improvise. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, what games or other pieces of media have influenced your current composition or sound design process? I'll, uh, all I want to say was uh, I'm influenced a lot by metal in particular, like metal, the genre. Um, a lot of like the production techniques and style of mixing influences my choices. I know that's kind of weird since I worked on a dating game simulator, but um i still feel like the principles of mixing apply in terms of punchiness and then in terms of like the experimentation in the metal genre uh i just grew up a metalhead so i'm like in love with the genre and like all aspects um yeah that's it that's that's what influences me some most of the time go ahead mark uh i was gonna say is i, I think that that changes for me mm -hmm. like depending upon what i'm working on like for instance, um, uh, for something like Borderlands, uh, there was Dune, there was uh, Blade Runner, there was those kinds of things, especially Blade Runner for the more sort of like edgy and synth driven music and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, but then with Harry Potter, um, because we changed into fantasy and magic and we wanted to understand uh, how they treated spells and explosions and, projectiles and the other things that, that are in that film, like what were those um, keywords or descriptive words. Um, but yeah, it, it, it kind of changes for me every time. I will say that there are some standouts, like obviously I think uh, uh, Breath of the Wild um, is a great sounding game. Mm -hmm. um, I love the way that the music interacts with the player and it feels like, it almost feels scripted enough to be cinematic, but um, uh, and I think uh, a game like even Red Dead Redemption and the way they treated their music and, and just the use of space was was something we could learn from. Like, you know, it's it's kind of like pick and pull from lots of different things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think inspiration is really going to run the gamut uh, depending on the context of the project. I mean, there have been, there have been projects where I've been inspired by books. Um, you know, I know when I was working on Hyperlight Drifter, uh, reading uh, the Miyazaki manga, uh, Nausicaa Valley of the Wind, like that, that manga had a really big influence on, uh, it's hard to maybe quantify that, like in a very concrete way, since it's, you know, it's a book, but um, just the world building, like it, it really helped inspire me to, with my, with my writing. Um, you know, there have been projects where the influences are they're given sometimes, you know, because you're working with a creative director who is sort of the vision holder for that project. And um, I, I, you know, I've worked on a lot of projects like that. And I, I quite like that opportunity to sort of be a creative chameleon um, who's going to come in and like try to occupy a new 
a new space that I haven't occupied before. I tend to learn a lot um, in those types of experiences. Um, so you know, the influences can really, you know, they can really come from from anywhere. I mean, there there are also, you know, the personal influences, though, of course, that um, have just come from, you know, my upbringing and and um, you know, just just the work that I wrote like for myself. You know, the music that I wrote for myself. So like coming up, I was really into um, new metal as a teenager and prog rock, and then I got into minimalism, like the music of Steve Reich. Um, and I've always been, I've always been interested in, in video game music, especially, um, you know, the work of Koji Kondo, uh, all the old, you know, classic NES games, um, you know, the work of, uh, Yasunori Mitsuda who did Chrono Cross and Chrono Trigger. Um, and, uh, you know, later on got in, got more into jazz and got into, um, film scores. So, you know, the influences can really come from, from all over the place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I relate a lot to what Rich said, where depending on the project, your influences change a lot. Uh, but then personal preferences wise, um, I grew up just listening to the same FF7 soundtrack on loop. Uh, and we had very little access to music, so that was it. Um, so I listened to a lot of that and that definitely like plays a part with how I write and stuff. Um, well, yeah, like influence comes from a whole variety of things and like genres and sometimes it's a concert or like a YouTube video you saw that, hey, that's really cool what they're doing there. Um, but aside that, I guess the Near series is a big heartthrob. Uh, I just can't get over how perfect the entire soundtrack is. It's, it's just perfect. Awesome. When working on the sequel to a game or DLC, how do you preserve the original sound of the game while also adding your own touch to it? <coughs> Never worked on a sequel or a DLC, so I think I'll I'll stand out on this one. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> uh, I think for us, um, a lot of well, <clears throat> so the core gameplay loop essentially always stays the same. So like. If you go from uh, like Borderlands 3 to the DLCs or Borderlands 2 to Borderlands 3, um, we redid um, all of the sound design um, from the ground up <clears throat> as we moved to Borderlands 3, but most, mostly because we wanted to provide something different for the player as far as uh, randomization and, and covering a bazillion weapons. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but the mainstay, I think, was probably uh, more about the music. Um, there's a lot of connective tissue between one, two, and three uh, musically, um, even though those themes change um, because the environments change <clears throat> and they introduce new planets in BL3. Uh, but at the same time, like we, we lean into a lot of the same instrumentation, um, just different ways of um, putting that together and composing it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, like Wonderlands is a completely different different soundscape musically than what Borderlands was mostly because we moved from sci-fi to magic or fantasy. Um, but the DLCs that will follow would, you know, would be along that same lines. And then also the characters, uh, the new characters that come on play, mm -hmm. let me pull a lot from the palettes that we've already created um, just to give them some connectivity as well. Gotcha. Yeah. I wasn't the original sound designer for Outer Wilds, but they did an expansion, they did DLC for it. Mm -hmm. And I was the only sound designer for that. And so I basically had to go in and find out kind of what they did for the previous version, see what I could do with it. And a big part of that is finding kind of like a lexicon to describe whatever those, that palette is. Is it soft? Is it horrific? Is it terrible? Is it shrill? What are these words that are coming to my mind specifically? It doesn't, they're subjectives, but it will change depending on who's listening. And then saying, okay, how would I make a soft sound within this universe? How would I make something shrill within this universe? What is shrill within this space? Because it'll change depending on project to project. And then making that kind of lexicon, dictionary, whatever at the very beginning makes it really easy later because you kind of have bookmarks of, oh, okay, this would sound like this, this would work within this, this will fit. And that makes it easy for you to put your own spin on it because you can just say, how would I make this sound like horror within this world? Oh, I already have a general idea. Let's work in this direction. And there's a lot of iteration. It's never right on the first try when you're doing something like that. It's usually like, oh, let's try this. OK, and we're closer, 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 done. Game industry or game development is just a bunch of failures until a game comes out. <laughs> and so it's a lot of that process, too. 
Fantastic. Um, we've got another softball. How does one get started in the industry? <laughs> Super <laughs> simple. <laughs> I, I guess I'll start. Everyone is about to answer in a radically different way. And that's the best and worst part in that there's no one way. But Jason Graves, the composer of Dead Space, put it really well. He said, you don't break into the industry, you ooze into it. Meaning you gradually kind of make your steps into it. And that will be different for everybody. It might be going to conferences, it might be coming to events like this, it might be anything, it could be absolutely anything. It could be sharing stuff on Twitter or Discord or anything like that. But the core of it is just making sure you make stuff and talk to people. You need those two things. You need to be able to make stuff and you also need to, to be talking to people because if no one knows you exist, that's really hard. And if you can't make things that would support a game, that's also really tough. So make sure you at least have those two. I really love this question. Um, so I started on in the industry two and a half years ago. So um, like right before the pandemic and before that I was still in school. So timing was not great. Um, but I think what I did do right was that even in school I would go to a lot of um, game jams. I would, I think do like monthly game jams at that point, if not two a month, which was insane. But like I learned speed very quickly. Um, I would go to all these play tests. I would just go out to local events. Um, I wasn't even going to that much, that many things internationally, but um, because I lived in Montreal back then, um, there was a big local hub. Um, and so I took part of in that quite a bit. And like Akash put it, well, as Jason put it, I oozed into the industry where it was like, the game audio community is super tight knit. Uh, whether it be online on Twitter, on Slack, or in person in Montreal. And um, it's the community that helped me, I guess, quote unquote, break into the industry. Uh, basically somebody going like, hey, we need a composer for this, you're cool. Um, and that was it. Um, so like, yeah, like it's important to work on your craft, but um, I feel like audio is such a competitive industry to put it bluntly. And there's so little jobs for the amount of people that like getting the support of not only does it help you like get started in your career but it's just like great moral support um and it's somewhere where i can fall back on and i'm super super happy to be part of the community yeah i have um one of the questions i get asked oftentimes that's sort of a follow-up to this question uh, is like, what school should I go to? Like what educational institute? <clears throat> and there's lots out there. There's lots, there's lots of places to go. Um, I think for me, like getting started in audio, because uh, I did not start in games, I started in the music industry. Um, the big advantage for me was just that I didn't wait for my degree. Um, like I started working in studios, uh, doing record production or music production and doing live sound like my first year in, um, I just found somebody who would let me like lift gear and move stuff around. And then I became a monitor engineer and then I became a front of house guy. And then I got an internship in the studio and ended up working with guys like Eric Schilling who did all the 90 sound machine stuff. And that was just by happenstance. Like uh, it was just the fact that I, I wanted to be involved um, all the time. And uh, nowadays, you know, you have YouTube and things like that. And we found um, really great junior candidates. Uh, matter of fact, we've hired two of them um, just from uh, like Twitter and YouTube, um, looking at their YouTube videos about their exploration into WYs and their exploration into sound design. And um, one guy even started um, kind of a little round table <clears throat> of just sound design exercises. He was like, make an explosion, but don't use anything that has to do with an explosion. Um, and we found that fascinating. Like one of my sound designers ran across it and realized, started digging into him and realizing that he was doing this kind of stuff all the time. Um, and it, it drew attention and we called him. Um, so uh, I would say just be assertive um, and, and be public with your experimentation and uh, get out and like people come to you uh, if you put that stuff out there. All right, um, moving on. <laughs> what is one lesson you've learned from working in the composition 
and sound design industry. Uh, for me personally, it's just keeping your process really simple as much as possible, because uh, especially in game music, your projects can get out of hand pretty quickly. So like musically speaking, just keep your uh, workflow and your pipeline really simple as far as like churning out songs or demos or ideas, especially for that in regards to that, churning out ideas quickly is kind of a, uh, a pillar of the game industry when you're reiterating. So uh, being able to do that fast or uh, completely change what you're making on the fly kind of um, is very important. So keeping it simple. A big part of it is people. It's a huge part of this. Uh, I, I mean, I owe Rich a huge part of my, I mean, all of my success so far in this industry because, you know, he put in a really good word for me with the Hyperlight team and then the rest was history. But it's all because we met in a hallway in Berkeley out of pure chance. I just walked up to some wild haired stranger while well, I had wild hair as well and just said, hey, do you know where room 268 is? He's like, video game music club? I'm going there too. <laughs> Years later, it turned into something. But that's a really important part and that's a really important lesson. It's, it's such a people focused industry. All industries are in like MMA or something where you have to hit other people, but everything else is all about those personal connections and all that sort of good stuff. It's wildly, wildly important to long-term success and getting you know a, a positive career in this industry or any industry really. Mm -hmm. I think Akash and Ramsey have nearly nailed it. Like kindness is very underrated um, and it's a bit like seen as a soft skill, but for me, it's very much a major skill. Um, no one wants to work with a jerk. It's to simply put it, it's just not worth it. It doesn't matter how good you are. Um, but to bounce off what Ramsey said, something that I um, heard from, there's this really good podcast called Beard, Cats and Indie Games uh, with uh, Matt from Clay. And um, I remember them telling in the podcast that only buy gear that you can afford to that that'll pay itself back. And as a very broke student with no jobs, uh, when I got out of school, I mean, not sustainable, at least uh, this, uh, this tip was incredibly important. And I think basically saved my career in a sense where I didn't, I don't feel the need to buy software and plugins and gear. I'm just not a gearhead. Um, and that money instead goes into, hey, can I like go to a conference or can I go to this because I don't need that thing. And there's a lot of peer pressure almost to buy all this, you know, the, the, the must have plug plugins or softwares or whatever. But hearing that podcast made me think that, wow, I really don't need much. Doesn't mean I don't buy anything. It's just that unless I feel like there's a major need, I do not purchase it. Uh, my costs, I think, in terms of gear and softwares are quite low. And um, yeah, I, that, that was a tip that has helped me quite a bit financially. And that means that I can still continue the career uh, because coming from where I grew up and everything, finances were a very big, important part. And I was terrified to enter the industry uh, in, in a career like this. Um, but seeing that it is sustainable um, gives me confidence now. I think what I would say is that when you're starting, it's great to be open to a lot of different kinds of opportunities if you, if you can manage to um, find them and to put yourself in lots of different situations because it's really important to kind of figure out what, what you like and what you don't like and what, you're, you know, what sort of scenarios you thrive in and what sort of scenarios you don't thrive in. And the best way to do that is to just kind of put yourself out there and, and try stuff. Um, and then later you can kind of start to, you know, if, you're, you know, if, if things, go your way, you can start to um, like narrow things down a little bit and, and focus more on the particular areas that you really like. Uh, like for me, you know, when I, when I started, um, I was able to work in a studio kind of environment um, around other, like, like in a game studio. And um, th th those experiences kind of helped me figure out that, um, you know, for me personally, I preferred to be a freelancer and kind of do my own thing. And the only way that I, you know, I, probably would have known that is, is to just ha to, to have um, said yes to, you know, basically making sounds for a project um, and that being like sort of my primary focus on something um, where, you know, music has always been a primary focus of mine. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm grateful that I, uh, you know, tried to, you know, see if I could do sound design and see, you know, see if that was for me. And I, I know that um, 
you know, I know that Akash actually kind of has the, maybe even the flip, the flip version of that story. So, uh, yeah. I stole all my answers. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I agree with what everybody said. Um, I think that um, being open creatively, realizing there's no rules and, and really no bound, bounds, um, um, exploring your own space and, and pulling from the influence of others um, uh, and, and humility, first and foremost. Um, always understanding that no matter how good you think you are, there's always somebody better. Um, and uh, leaning into the wisdom of others, uh, not just from a creative standpoint and the, the actual technical aspects of it, but like learning from others about how they handle relationships um, and hand, how they handle peers and those kinds of things. Because uh, like the creative space uh, can semi, sometimes be combative because there's a lot of people who are passionate about what's going on and they all have different ideas. Um, it's, under, it's, it's been important for me to really understand that that's the catalyst. Like they're just passionate about it. Um, it's, it's not about um, a push and pull as much as it is about just working together to find the best uh, common ground, so. Thank you. All right, I have one last question and I wanted to give the audience a heads up just in case they'll be thinking about your questions um, that we'd like to share after this. Uh, the final question I have is, what are the challenges in maintaining your creative vision while meeting the vision of the developer or the director that is overseeing the project? And what are some ways that you can help balance those two? Um, I think I think that projects they sort of have like an immutable like desire to 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 have a certain sort of um, like creative uh, sound or or identity, and that's that's a good thing to know. I think that. You know, like like for me, I always bring an agenda to I bring in a creative agenda to every project that I work on, and um, you know that, that but that's not always it's not always going to work out and go your way, and you're not always going to get to do the things that you want to do, and and oftentimes the things that you think that you would would like to do for the project they you know they may not serve the project, so I think it's really important to try to figure out like where the you know where the overlap is between you know the things that you really want to do. For the project and the things that the project needs, um, I think for different people there may be a different balance of these two things. But I've always tried to like, um, like carve out a particular trajectory with my projects because um, it's it's a part of my personal sort of engine as far as like what motivates me to work on things is is I have things that I would like to accomplish on each project, and so you know I try to I try to um, I try to achieve those things when it when it makes sense. Um, uh, it's definitely something that is worth, um, you know, thinking about, uh, especially early on in, in, in the process of, of starting. Yeah, just to agree with what Rich was saying, um, for me, it just uh, trying to um, make sure you're always serving the narrative or the gameplay in some uh, peripheral, even, even in a peripheral sense. Um, make sure you're serving it with what you're doing and then put your creative touches through that. So if you're able to infuse your creative touch through what is essentially serving the gameplay or the narrative, you should, uh, in theory, never have an issue <laughs> having any creative uh, bounce back. But yeah, just to agree basically with what he's saying, um, make sure you're savoring that narrative and that gameplay and it should work out. I think this is where like, I like having a lot of time put away for pre-production. So we're not even touching the game and like a couple weeks, I would say just on that, if that is affordable um, or just, you know, bringing in the composer early on on the project so that you have time to like have those discussions because, you know, midway through the game is not when you want to realize, hey, I kind of want to go for a chip tune style now, oops. Um, so spending those couple of weeks bouncing, bouncing ideas back and forth with the creative director has helped me a lot. And there's always this middle compromise and like understanding where they're coming from, because oftentimes they don't have the musical language that you're used to. So they'll say something like warm, but it actually means fast. Um, so like understanding their language and getting to know them during pre-pro um, could really help 
in like blending our like both views together. Yeah, to echo, I mean, everyone spot on, just like Mark said earlier, you all saw my answers. Thank you for that. <laughs> Uh, but uh, <laughs> there's a uh, there's you know there's a common concept in all video game development called concept art for that exact reason to get a concept and make sure people are agreeing on the visuals of it and doing that for audio sound design music maybe even voiceover voiceover processing things like that is helpful especially if you have the time you don't always have the time to do this but having some sort of con concepting phase where you're talking to the developers or the director or whoever it may be saying like, how's this deal? How's the sound? Is this working? Even if you're syncing it up to gameplay, you're not even implementing it yet. You're just doing a video capture and putting some sounds under it. You can at least start getting in a direction earlier on. And once you're on, you get to that quote unquote right path faster, then it's a lot easier to play within that space and know that none of your efforts are gonna be you know, wasted because you're not gonna be playing in a space that it turns out that the director of the project or whoever doesn't need or doesn't want. It's not always, it doesn't always work that cleanly. There are absolutely times where you make stuff and you're like, oh, for six months, it turns out this isn't the way to do it. Oops, that does happen. But doing your best to concept things out will hopefully prevent that a little bit. Um. For me, uh, and this isn't as applicable to the freelance space, but uh, on the internal side, as an audio director, like I feel like one of my responsibilities is education, um, and not education for my team, but education for the studio. Um, oftentimes, decisions and um, they, decisions that are made creatively by level design or, or otherwise uh, gameplay systems, um, they don't really take into account audio. Um, and it's not because they don't care about audio, it's because they don't understand audio. Um, they don't understand the language, they don't understand the possibilities, uh, they don't understand those kinds of things. <clears throat> so um, uh, I spoke about like palette building and doing things like that earlier. One of the advantages to that approach for us in the pre-production phase is being able to take a piece of concept art and just come up with um, our own version of an action skill or our own uh, environmental palette for ambience or music or whatever. And we push that back up the stream before we even get visuals. Um, what this does for us is we're not necessarily looking for feedback. I mean, feedback is always welcome, but what it does is it engages. It engages them to be a part of the process for us. And um, I can't speak to probably a more important thing. Matter of fact, I probably should go back to the prior question. Um, but it's just super important. Like that level of engagement is super important because audio historically in any form of media is reactive. Like it's it's the last thing in the pipe. And to be able to affect change at an early or be engaged in pre-production or affect those creative decisions, um, it oftentimes has to be tactile. Like they have to hear a thing. Um, and you have to put that to visuals and you have to do that research and you have to do that development on your own in order just to make a case for maybe a creative change you want to make, um, and which is fine. Um, but over time, what I've seen, and, and this is something I've been pushing pretty heavy for about the last four years, uh, um, is that uh, now like the enemies team will come up with a new enemy and they'll actually engage my producer and say, hey, can we set up a meeting to go over like what this guy sounds like? Now that's something that never happened before. It was always just us getting a task and filling the task and putting it in. So I guess I guess my, my point is is that um, um, the, the the creative uh, sort of back and forth is, is definitely a two way street. Like you have to put that effort in from an audio perspective to educate people on what that language is and, and what those palettes are, what the possibilities are mostly, um, in order to have those conversations and and them understand uh, and it to affect change. Awesome. Thank you for your thoughtful answers. Um, I'm going to open it up to audience questions now. Uh, we've got one right off the bat from Trinity McKellen in the chat here, and they ask, are there any internship opportunities for sound design or composition uh, at video game companies? Uh, we just hired an intern. Mm -hmm. um, we just started a program where uh, we do 12 weeks uh, starting uh, May sometime in May, mm -hmm. um, but we do 12 weeks um, uh, and they come on to paid internship. Um, and basically our process is to step them through each of the sub-disciplines of audio. So they spend uh, like two weeks with VO, two weeks with music, two weeks with sound design and two weeks with tech. Wow. And um, 
like it's something that uh, Gearbox has really pushed for, mm-hmm. and um, and I think is a great idea. Yeah. yeah. All right. It looks like that's all of our chat questions for now. If anyone in the audience, yes, uh, feel free to come on up. So alongside my work in academia, I'm also a professional musician. I work as a self-employed musician in Britain, and I have done for the last 10 years or so. And when I was just starting out, uh, one of the really big things that helped me was the presence of a strong trade association in Britain, who provided me with sample contracts, helped me find examples of other people doing the kind of work I was doing and how much they would pay for it, uh, helped me network. There were networking groups, they provided me legal advice, things like this. Now, are you aware of any trade associations like that in the US or in North America? And which of those would you recommend someone just starting out in the industry should join or consider joining uh, to get that kind of support early in their career? From my point of view, I don't know of like specific trade organizations necessarily, but there are definitely people sharing that sort of stuff online. I'm actually one of them. Hello. Um, so I do a lot of sharing of like contracts, how to negotiate, all that sort of stuff. Um, but there are also, you know, game audio meetups and game audio discords that have a lot of pros in there that are more than happy to help if you just say like, does anyone have XYZ or like, does X, do people have XYZ in their contract or how do I phrase this? Now they're not lawyers, obviously, you'd still hire one of those, but they can at least set you up with the right way to think about things. Or you can, you can at least ask, like, I get asked all the time of like, they t- someone tells me about a project, they're like, <coughs> how much should I charge? Which is, you know, I can't answer that directly, but I'll teach them how to think about it. So I'm not sure about trade organization, organizations, maybe you know, but. I mean, there's the IGDA. Yeah. Um, uh, they're relatively large for a game organization and they have lots of good resources um and uh, there's some really super folks in that organization that can answer a lot of these types of questions it's funny that you asked this question because uh, i'm on several groups that are just uh like game industry guys most of them younger and they ask these same questions all the time like how much do i charge for composition how much do i charge for sound design um, they don't want to pay me. Why not? Uh, <laughs> those kind of questions. But yeah, um, uh, IGDA and um, uh, and then also uh, some of the conferences like Game SoundCon and GDC are are good places to network and find people who are um, who can facilitate uh, and help with those kinds of those kinds of questions. There's IA SIG as well, Interactive Audio Special Interest Group. IA SIG. Uh, that's a really good one too. Thank you. Well, I think we have time for one more. Yeah. Come on up. Should we had prices right music. By the uh the legendary Ed Kalhoff. <laughs> Hi, welcome. Uh so y'all talked a bit about how y'all work with uh other people in the design process and how is other helpful in that process. And so as someone who wants to be on those other ends rather than use it, what is something y'all think is helpful that us on that end should do or consider that is helpful to keep up that collaboration and make things run smoothly? And just to be clear on that end, you mean like you as a developer working with like, audio people? Or developing, uh, writing or something I want to go into or just creating things like that. Um, I was having a conversation with an art director the other day, and um, he mentioned to me that um, the way that he comes up with concept art is by listening to music. Like he sits and he just puts on a playlist and he just draws and he does his thing. Now, not everybody, that's not everybody's thing, but but um, it was interesting to me to, for him to, to, to use that as his source of inspiration. I mean, the, the, the music and audio in general can be as much an inspiration as the visual um, it's just about engaging and level of interest. Like, I don't know that there's any, any like, you should be doing this um, kind of thing, but uh, it, it's always like, if you're working for a developer uh, and this is a question you want to answer, like maybe reach out to that audio team, um, form a relationship with one of those, those people and, and just see if they can like kind of be more inclusive uh, about meetings or anything you're interested in. 
Um, even if you're just a fly on the wall, uh, most of the time, at least at Gearbox, like anybody can come to a meeting. Uh, they don't all get, get invited, but if they're interested, they're welcome. So, um, so yeah, little, little things like that, you know, uh, it's just about kind of putting yourself out there, you know? Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. All right. I think that's going to conclude our working in the industry panel. Thank you so much for being here. We're going to take a short break before we move on to our. Uh, oh, we have one more question. Sorry about that. Yeah, come on up. No, absolutely not. Get up here. It's not right. <laughs> Hello, thank you all for uh, lending your expertise today. Uh, so this is my this question is kind of based off of uh, uh, or coming out of the Ludomusicology panel. That's uh, if Ludomusicology folks were interested in you know, basically interviewing you all um, about your process for you know a forthcoming paper or something or chapter in a book or something. Uh, you know, would that be an agreeable kind of thing for you? And if so, what's the best way for them to reach out to you and you get a hold of you? All? The answer is yes, absolutely. Um, everyone's going to have their own like way that you can get in touch with them. Um, you know, for me, I, uh, I have a website with a contact form, and that's usually how I how I communicate with people. Um, so yeah, yeah, same answer. Yeah. yeah, same answer as Rich. Uh, Twitter, email, website. <laughs> me three. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, panelists, thank you for your time. Uh, we'll take a short break, and then we have two more paper presentations coming after this, so stick around. Thank you. Okay. Now, before we conclude today's festivities, I would like to uh, invite uh, Kristen and Sabino up for some closing remarks. They're gonna do some tech stuff real quick. They're our behind the scenes people have been all day. Let's get a round of applause for them. Real quick. Thank you. Okay, and in just a second, they will be here. <laughs> well, first and foremost, thank you everybody for coming. This was, um, it's been a long time in the making and is the executed vision really of playing in Sabino. <laughs> and so it's, it's just great that y'all are here with us. And also many thanks to all of our panelists and presenters. Um, and to our supervisor, Susanna, and uh, Sue Parks um, for supporting our our effort and um, vision for this for this conference. Many thanks also to all of our students who helped us today and our um, music library colleagues for supporting the the, um, the symposium today and all the various tasks involved with making it happen. I'm going to add that I want to thank our sponsors who helped sponsor our event. And I want to thank uh, the Dean and her Dean's Innovation Grant who helped us fund this uh, symposium, as well as the Global Venture Fund, who also helped us fund this uh, symposium. And one more thank you. Today, the Media Library, our UNT Media Library, came out and tabled. They are amazing. If you're a UNT student, please go out and see them. If you're visiting, Go see them anyway. It's a cool place. It's awesome. So thank you to them. Um, this has been a really cool experience, and it's really great to have you all here, whether it be a panelist or a poster presenter or a paper presenter or just an attendee. We're really thankful that you were here for even just a part of our day, if it wasn't all day. Before we go, we have a couple other things. Um, if you're interested in some food, we have some bagels and chipotle left over for our people here, so you can pick some up and take it with you if you want to. Um, other than that, we will be having a jam session tonight focused on video game music at 8 p.m. at First United Methodist Church of Denton. That's right off the Denton Square downtown. 
um, go ahead and plug it into your Google Maps if you're interested. Join us there at eight o'clock. We will break for dinner. And we really are thankful that you came out today. So thank you very much.